Are you ready then? Uh, yeah, I'm good. I'm good. No, I'm, I'm talking to him. He's the one who's fucking sat there looking at Zanga or some shit. <laughs> What's Zanga? Like that reference there, look up. So you don't even know that reference. You're too young for that. You're too young for that. You know what that reference is, Dylan? No, actually, I don't. Right. It was at, back in the day, in the early days of the internet, there was a blog site called Zanga, and every Asian American kid had one of these. I don't know why Asians specifically had Maybe it was to do with like anime or something. I don't know. Was oh, it like an, the <coughs> anime blogs that people would have? I, I like actually think yeah. I think I know what you're talking about. Yeah. Basically, if Loco, I, I guess he was maybe slightly too young. If he'd been a bit yeah, older, a bit... he would have yeah, definitely yeah. had one of them. Because the other thing was as well, it was the sort of blogs where every post was like, ooh, ooh oh, I'm all sad and emo. And then the girls would be like, oh, I think you're really cute. And like, oh, really? That's and my face. Go, exactly. That's exactly. He swagger jacked the entire site, basically. That's what I'm saying. So. <laughs> <laughs> I think we started now. This is episode 76 of Listen Loco. Mm -hmm. And even though, for whatever reason, I'm supposed to be like on good behavior now and not wrecking mm -hmm. local, I will just say one thing at the beginning of the episode, Loco. Go for it. Which is, you know when people say facts, but normally they just mean I have an opinion that I think's right. I'm going to give you an actual fact. Let's hear it. Is you used to book this show for like, what, 70 episodes? Like add in the world's ones that say maybe mm -hmm. maybe even 80. You did quite a lot of booking, right? Yeah. All I'm going to say is this, Loco. Never saw your boy Path. He never showed up. Never saw him. <laughs> I had him on Narrative Wick. Don't worry oh about that. Oh, my God. Never saw Dylan <laughs> here when he was coaching for Natic. Now he's coaching, you know. They mm -hmm. Never saw him making an appearance. I kept wondering, where are all these people? I thought oh. they were all your mates, Loco. Are like, you just going to call in the favor? So, all I'm saying is mm -hmm. your boy takes over doing the booking. <laughs> What do you know? Listen, no one turns down that red phone when it starts to call. Dylan no, is Loco did message me about being on this show before, okay. but it's just bad timing, and I don't really respond to many messages from mm. anyone. From Loco, so. yeah, mm? we understand, yeah. yeah. Listen, mm? listen, you already put up with him on TSM. You, you did your time, mate. You're out of prison now. You don't need to. You can you go and solo yourself. You're a coach, oh. successful. He's just on a fucking talk show, isn't he? So I think it's the other way around. Loco has to work his way up before you should answer his calls. That's when it's fair. Wow, yeah. I see how it is. Damn, I got Get on his level. I got Dylan started in East for you. What the hell? Yeah, yeah, uh, actually, that's really true. How, how'd that work out for you, local? I'm really well. Like I, um, I there's definitely time for. Oh my god, we're <coughs> starting the episode pretty strong. I didn't think Dylan did a great job on Immortals, but I think elsewhere, like Dylan killed it. I think on Fnatic, he actually did really well. Shaka, I actually have no idea about. Or not no idea, but I can't really say if he, it's a great yeah. job, or if it's a bad job, or for Fnatic, like mad props. So I actually think. Yeah, Dylan turned out really well, and I was 100% correct to bring Dylan on board. <laughs> so he just gave himself props at the very end there. Like, he even said, right, this is what this is how mad Loco Doco's brain is. He goes like, Dylan, you know, I never actually thought you were that good, to be honest. When you were on Immortals, could take you or leave, you thought you were shit. So anyway, in the end, you got really good, so good job I brought you into the industry. Like, yeah. I mean, so, you asked me... Logic? You asked me... Like, <laughs> You asked me how it turned out, and I literally just told you how it turned out. Right, my mistake, Loco. Thank you for literally repeating to me as though you were a robot and humor doesn't mm -hmm. exist. The facts of what happened there. My mistake. I thought we were having you were a asking. Ra you thank were you asking for doing it again. Th no, thank no. you for doing it again and ruining no the segment for a second straight time <laughs> because you don't understand the premise of humor. So, mm -hmm. but I guess we'll just. All right, you know what? This is what we're gonna do, right? Facts. Welcome to Mr. Loco. Welcome, Mr. Loco. Thanks for joining us, Dylan, mm -hmm. a coach of a team. No opinion either way on what, what, what the coach uh -huh. is like. Just keep doing a good job. Loco Doco here, co-host. Hope it turns out well. Hope he's got a load of really straight fire jokes lined up for everyone. I don't get... Not, it's going to be a pretty fucking dry episode, I'm going to tell you guys. It's not the LCS desk. You don't have to be so robotic. Well, <laughs> I guess you've got a fucking broke. Hmm? Is he you gone? Oh, man. Holy fuck. He was about to shit on the LCS desk with me, and then I think the Riot people got him. Give yeah, it a few yeah, seconds, yeah. and then he's going to come back. <laughs> the, Riot, the Riot police are, Riot Games police are here to take away. Uh -huh. No. Oh, man. Oh, man. So, um, let's actually give him a minute. Well, there we go. Maybe he comes back. I was actually there the whole time. It's just for what, like, I could hear you both the whole time. We had the Discord work again, whatever. Mm -hmm. Right, anyway, I wasn't actually going to put back on on... LCS, I was going to wreck you, but whatever. Well, there'll be time for that later. We'll be playing. Are you really drinking oh, Soylent right now? I drink Soylent every episode. 
Here's the thing, mate. Mm-hmm. Like, normally people make fun of people who drink soy. At this point in time, I look at you and say, just eat any food you can, mate. Any food that you can get through your mouth, do it as much as you can. Mm-hmm. And one day, we'll make a man out of you. We'll mm-hmm. make a man out of you. <laughs> like the Mulan song. Mm-hmm. There we go. Wait, what's wrong with right. Foyland? Foyland's so convenient. I think Foyland's the future. <laughs> you should do commercials for them. I think you should be the ideal soylent consumer. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think in the future, people will just drink different flavors of Foyland, and hopefully, one bottle per day is like enough to make you full the entire day. I don't know about that. I, I personally, I don't think the human body will ever operate that way. But whatever. Mm-hmm. Let's actually talk about fucking League of Legends, shall Go we? So Loco touched on it a little bit there when he was doing one of his classic like backhanded compliment to himself yeah. somehow. I don't know how that works. But you were really alluded, bad, but yeah. Yeah, when he alluded to some of the other teams you were a part of, <clears throat> obviously this isn't like a long form interview, so we don't have to go into it a lot, but give us a few thoughts on that. So like, for example, it's not an LCS episode, but Hooney's still around. He still plays in LCS. You had Hooney when he was at, uh, arguably at his best when he was on that Immortals team. Even though Loco joked that he wasn't sure, like the regular splits you guys had were insane. I think you lost like what? One game, two games over two entire splits. Pretty crazy stuff. Give us your side, because I've never really heard you address it very much in interviews. So. Yeah, I don't think what, I've what, ever really talked about what happened that year. What could um, you tell us? It's up to you how much you want to say, but what, what would you say yeah, about what went wrong? I probably still probably won't want to talk about like absolutely everything, because obviously sure. it takes... It's, uh, yeah. Um, but I think a lot of things really went well on Immortals that year, and it really sucks so much that we didn't end up going to Worlds or winning a split or something like an actual achievement. Because as far as like day-to-day running of a team and like the infrastructure and our daily schedule and how we were practicing, reviewing, doing everything, honestly, of the like three, four years, five years, I think maybe now I've been working in esports, it probably was the best and the most productive <coughs> and like one of the best like training environments I've seen, especially like spring and early summer split. But like ultimately, what we just choked in playoffs two times, no, and then there was the the Lucian top thing, yes. and then... the meme that haunts you to this day. Yeah. Yes. Well, actually, you know what? I actually think the Lucian top thing, I've completely, it's gone now. Like nobody means me for Lucian top anymore because I feel like the fanatic stuff is way more important. Mm-hmm. So sure. I finally, it took a while, but I think yes. I'm finally past that one. Um, and I think somewhere was really close, no. Like we lost in game five in a really, really, to C9, really right? close. Yeah, to C9 in mm-hmm. a really close series. Of course, we were better than CLG at the end of that split. We just were. We beat them, I think, in two consecutive BO3s and one BO5 in playoffs. But just the way circuit points work is they go to Worlds and we don't. And sure. yeah, it was, it was really, really <clears throat> unfortunate. Like obviously, Lucian top series. I'm head coach of the team for sure. At least partially, if not all my mm-hmm. fault um of course um not in the way that i think the public would blame that on actually like looking back on it but there's decisions i made at certain points throughout the split and preparation for that that yeah for sure mm-hmm. uh, I'll, i can take responsibility for that one when you were having those splits though where like i say in the regular season the records were insane like when you like famously yeah. if everyone remembers when you combined the fanatic period before that who had been in like him and reno had an insane record in regular season games they barely ever lost did, did If it was going that easily, did you just think to yourself, like, fucking hell, this coaching stuff's easy. I'm, I'm basically the best already. Um, No, I just thought my team was really, really, really good. Uh, like, uh, okay. the team was... See, Loco's really never admitted that. He always tries to claim, like, you know, he made the team. Always, you see how always. It is. Yeah. It's always Actually, him who but, did the job. Okay, I, I can be nice. <clears throat> I thought Loco was pretty bad, but no, no, I'm just kidding. Uh. You were coaching a bunch of rookies, no? And you made third place in that spring split. That was pretty good, no? I thought you did a good job that split. Oh. Like, if you look at our roster versus your mm-hmm. roster and what ended up happening, mm-hmm. it yeah, yeah. worked out good. That was the uh, Dardock days, right? Yeah, that I was mean, the he was days. basically he was basically yeah. a fucking stress doll for Dardock. That was basically his role on the team. But yeah, he did a great yeah. fucking job doing that because then mm-hmm. the thing, Loco, is you, mm-hmm. you trained your whole life for that role. Yeah. I mean, that, then, that roster no. was so fucking hard to coach. I think that was like... Yeah. Piglet and Phoenix coming off of last year working with Peter was very, very not open to any kind of coaching and not open to like working with teammates. Like, and we started that year with like Quas and Smoothie, and the whole Quas incident happened, and Smoothie often cried because of Piglet. Like that relationship wasn't easily fixable. That was like, I actually think a lot of people will say, oh. Coach, like winning splits with TSM was like the highlight of my career. But in terms of like difficulty of what was put in front of me and the result that I got, I think that spring split with TL was the hardest and one of my best results. I think there's very few people, like 
I could probably name five coaches that could have done what I did on TSM, but I don't think there's any coach I can name that could have done what I did with TL that spring split. I legitimately don't think there's another coach that could have done what I did for TL that split. Well, having opinions is fun. Yeah, mm-hmm. we can all have different ones, so that's yours. Right. This is one of the reasons why. I right, if you don't think it's valid, if you don't think it's valid, do you think there's no validity? I think it's a ludicrous this? statement to say that only five other people in the whole fucking human race could have coached Team Liquid to third to fourth. I think that's oh. probably one of the stupidest things you've ever said in your life. But that's not. That's why I didn't I want to go into it yeah. because it's not that interesting. Right, you topic, can is it? you can go into it, but that's not even what I said. I said there's probably a lot of coaches that could have done what I did on TSM. No, you said you said there's probably no, not a lot said of coaches. You said for TSM, lots yeah. of coaches could have done well with TSM. Yeah, but there's not many that could have done what I did with TL. Yeah, that's exactly what I said. Yeah. No, you yeah. said so. Cormo couldn't have taken Team Liquid and done that. I honestly don't think he could have. Like, what if it? Right, exactly. Like I said, it's great to have opinions. There's not really an I mean, interest in opinion. Tell me all the reasons. Sure. Um, what's your viewpoint on it? If you think it's so ludicrous. I think there's loads of coaches could. I think you don't know much coaches. I don't uh, think you've ever talked to most coaches in the scene. I don't think you know the systems that most coaches have. Mm-hmm. I think that in this scenario, there's probably coaches that could have won the split with them. There's mm-hmm. probably coaches that could have come ninth place with them. I think it's just kind of like, well, it, it is the thing. Let's go, for, yeah, inter- let's go through a few listen, examples. In an interview, mm-hmm. don't be stupid, mate. I, in, go through I don't a few want to for a good show. This is, mm-hmm. this is stupid right now. Why? I, if, Dorian, if you truly believe there are, then let's go for it. <clears throat> So let me name every other coach mm. that I think is better than you. I haven't got fucking time, mate. It's a two-hour right. show. Right, anyway, into sure. what I was going to talk about. So, mm. Dylan, the reason why I wanted to ask initially about some of the historical stuff is because, obviously, since you moved over to Europe and you were coaching Fnatic, you can potentially give us some insight also into the Fnatic team and some of the things after that. So, yeah. since when you took over in Fnatic was actually when they just got in. They'd obviously just had Broxer mm. and Caps, and that'd come in with Nico the Pico, infamously was the coach of the team. And back then, people don't remember this because mm. now those players have massive profiles. But back then, these weren't big name players. Like Caps was considered like some crazy coin flip player, even in LCS. A lot of people wondered, mm. would he ever even be a good player? A lot of people were making him out like he was like a very hot and cold player. What, what was someone like that like in the early days to work with as a coach? So when I, when I actually first started working with Fnatic, um, they flew me out to Korea for um, Fnatic's Korean boot camp um, between the splits without Reckless there. Mm-hmm. It was just the four players without Reckless, okay? And they had, I think it was Mr. Rallis at the time subbing in. Okay. So I, I, I knew Jesse, right, before from Jess's from my time on Immortals. And they fly me out there, and it was just like only me and the team. So I had to run the boot camp uh, like basically by myself uh, in Korea. It was like my second second time there or something. So I'd already kind of been around the area, you know, where all the teams boot camp. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was my first time meeting all the players. And it was just like, the first impression was honestly hilarious. Like my first scrim set with this team, like we're playing some, I don't think it was like an LCK team, but it was at least like a Korean challenger team or an LPL team, like a decent team. And Caps is just like passed out on, on the couch. I have to like wake him up for scrims because he like hasn't slept. He's been playing solo queues since he got <clears throat> Korea for like 30 hours straight or something crazy. I have to like wake him up and he just like won't wake up. And then I get him into scrims and first scrim, he's just begging me to play Draven mid. <laughs> this was the, the introduction to Fnatic. It was like first game, he does something uh, like carries alone or something. Second game, can I play Draven here? Can I play Draven here? It's like really OP, really OP. Can I play Draven? So like uh, I'm like I, I guess okay you can play Draven. He locks in Draven mid level two flashes under the tower auto attacks the tower instead of the champion dies, <coughs> and then just like ints the whole game. And that was my like intro to Fnatic. So it was really crazy. Like it was Caps was a rookie. He was kind of unformed yet as a player. Broxo was also a rookie. He was very new to competitive play, and they had that kind of play style that they came up with at the end of spring that. Um, sort of bandaged a lot of their issues as a team, but allowed a Reckless to really like hard carry the sure. games. Mm-hmm. So that was the kind of system we ran with through most of the summer split, but it was a really interesting experience. It was really stressful, but um, ultimately I think we did really well. So, I mean, nowadays everyone knows like how special Caps is. Yeah. At what point did it click for you? Like this is a different player. Um, Almost right away, honestly. Like, really? You watch this guy play league for six seven eight games a day and you just see things every single day it's just like highlight reel it's really fun to watch actually i mean so people nowadays will say stuff like caps is probably going to be the best western mid we're ever going to get like at what point like were you like oh this is it like from the moment you started working with him like you felt that way or was it i would imagine it would come like later down the line with working with them probably scribbing at worlds that year i would say 
um, because we would scrim all the Western teams and all the Chinese teams um, and, and seeing that, I would say, because there's one thing in Europe, seeing him do really well, but there's another thing when you go international and you see him play against international players, he's playing that well, I'd say, yeah. Was it tough then? Uh, like, because since you were basically one of his earliest right, real coaches in LCS, was it tough to know with a player like that? Because if you see caps that exists now, one of the reasons why I, I think people have a very hard time knowing how much credit in G2 to give to grabs is pretty much all the players he's got are like fully formed players. They've all become yeah. really good. They've been to many different teams. The caps that you had kind of was a coin flip player. Like he could just throw the whole game. And also you didn't often even necessarily play through his lane, etc. Like what when the a player like that, the temptation, I'll give the analogy here to what Loco did. If you remember when Loco was the coach of TSM, and there's that famous thing where they they told like Wild Turtle, like, just don't flash in because you, you, you're misusing your flash. Like, you sort of, that your flash privileges are taken away. Just don't do it. Stay at the back. Just be an ADC. Like, there's a temptation when you have a wild player to do that. Put, put the reins on him a bit. So did you ever try to do that? Did you know that somehow you had to sort of just let him figure it out? What was the, what was the concept in the team? Um, so <coughs> with him... Never, ever, ever, and I, even on Schalke this year, uh, whenever I'm coaching, I don't think that holding players back from trying to outplay to being the best player they can be and be, play crazy and take risks is the right way to really reach the heights of the league. Um, that's like a mentality I had with Immortals. That's a mentality we had on Fnatic absolutely always. And I don't think anyone ever was like shaming Caps for playing aggressive or dying or taking risks. Um, a lot of it was more about how him and Broxa would transition leads. Like I remember at first in, in Summer Split when we were working with him, he would solo kill the enemy and then he'd run back to lane and try and solo kill the enemy again. And he'd run back to lane, try and solo kill the enemy again, et cetera, et cetera. But like, that's not really how League is played. It's like a team game. You need to set a vision, do a roam together with your advantages. You can't just like, I think he knew it was bad and maybe this was just in scrims because on stage it wasn't as big of an issue, but like it was more, playing with the team and playing with jungle and having Brox and Caps work together, I think was a lot of what at least I worked on with them. I, I like to think I helped them with it. And they kind of needed help from like Soaz and Reckless and just like Joey in the next year, for example, just everyone. Mm -hmm. okay. so, what one, about, um, well, yeah, one. one thing I'm really curious about is how Nico the Pico fit in all this. Cause I've heard publicly from Nico Pico's side, like what he said, and then also somewhat from what Amazing said, like it was really hard to piece together from Nico, Nico the Pico, what yeah. he said was he blueprinted the current Fnatic, or the 2018 Fnatic roster, where he said, we knew we were going to build around Caps and Broxa, we knew they were going to be the future, like the I scouted them and I knew this would be it. And yeah, I, I guess I'm really curious on what actually happened and how much involvement there was, how much planning there was from someone that actually worked within the org. So I was only actually with Fnatic after Nico left, Nico mm -hmm. Pico. So I've I've never actually had a conversation with the guy in my life. So mm -hmm. unfortunately, I'm not sure. Um, I know that they held tryouts in the off season where they tried out caps and tried out a bunch of different mids for both the academy team and the main team. Mm -hmm. And I think the thing was like caps would just still kill every single mid. Like it didn't matter who it was, level two, level three, they would just die. Mm -hmm. um, so it's clear that he was really, really good. And I think all the Fnatic players, um, and even going into week one of LCS, I know most of the players at least knew that this guy had in insane talent. So yeah, I'm sure the org knew and that he was going to be the future of the org, yeah. Oh. Um, but Do you think, I, I don't you know. I, 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 what sorry, about I've got a question. Mm -hmm. okay. 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 What about for the Broxus side? If Capsule um, was so obvious. But this, this is all like replacing Amazing with Broxa, drama or whatever whatever happened mm -hmm. i wasn't a part of it so i really don't <coughs> insight on it honestly okay okay this is one of the reasons why we'll never have timestamps for this show because local doesn't know how to do like topics in a row but never mind that we'll get there eventually one we'll just day, at the day. moment it's the free form segment of the show mm -hmm. my question i had about caps as well is do people actually overrate caps because like us like loco said there they don't just say he's the best player or he's the best player in g2 or he's the best western player they like even just a year or two into his career it's all the superlatives come out he's the best player that's ever going to be he's in the western fair kids like they go really far is that deserved um yeah probably i i think he's probably the the highest skilled cap kind of like skilled player i would say yeah but he's also played on really good teams right both of his teams sure. from and g2 mm -hmm. have had actual com i would say complete rosters which a lot of very um 
talented players never get the chance, I think, in their career to play in an actual complete roster of five like top players. So, yeah, it's it's a bit of both. But yeah, no, I think he deserves the credit he gets. Because one thing that I think is um, a bit weird is like now everyone acknowledges it best because G2 won MSI and they've looked so amazing yeah. since they formed the team. But what was funny was obviously it's pretty famous. North Americans generally don't watch LEC, European LCS, as it used to be called. It's just the wrong hours. They're not as interested. So if everyone had heard in 2018 the hype, like Caps is amazing, Caps is a god, and then they saw him at Worlds, they probably were underwhelmed, actually, mate. Like a lot of people think his Worlds performance wasn't that crazy, actually. But did you have a different perspective from inside? Um, well, first of all, it was complete Arden meta, right? It was like Jenna running around, buffing an AD carry who's trying to get items and scale to 30 or 40 minutes. And the oh, entire this is season meta... seven. I'm in season eight. Oh, season eight Worlds? Oh, you like last year's Worlds. Yes. Yeah. No. This is why he was supposed to take over the tournament and be the MVP, you know. Okay, I think there was drafting (laughs) issues, two games against Rookie. It's like best of ones, first of all, in group Mm -hmm. stage. So drafting issues, two games in group stage. Uh, He had really bad matchups. Um, That being said, in the second one, he got a lot of resources put towards his game and ended up like kind of carrying. Um, Set against EDG, mm, probably a bit of drafting issues. There's the Yasuo game where he kind of like did poorly against enemy Syndra. Mm-hmm. Um, probably a winnable matchup. I think he even solo killed him at one point. Yeah, I, I think maybe he didn't have like the absolute greatest tournament, but I still thought he played super good. Oh. And at least I, I also see a lot more scrims. So I, I see a lot more footage from playing at the tournament. Okay. I, I still find one of the best players there. So if I'm, the perspective that Dora mentioned is exactly me. I didn't watch any of... Uh, I watched some European LCS, and then I watched the uh, playoffs leading up into Worlds, and then I watched all yeah. of Worlds. Just from watching Worlds, it seems like Perks was a better mid laner than Caps was. Perks carried his team much harder. Perks had less around them. And I think if you isolate the world perform- Worlds performance only, Perks was a better mid for 2018 Worlds. Yeah, he, he carried his team a lot harder than Caps did to the point they got in Worlds. Absolutely. Yeah, that's true. Mm. Okay. What about this then? Because another aspect I'm very interested in, and obviously we're going to lead into this season of LEC and the other teams, etc. But I thought since we had someone who uniquely has been in some of the other big teams, you can actually answer, well, from your perspective, a lot of the questions that we have to just speculate about. Yeah. So one of the very interesting topics to me is obviously the Fnatic lineup that you had last year is the same Fnatic lineup now. They just have one player different. They have Nemesis instead of Caps, which to be fair, if you're saying he's the best Western player, it's a big difference, but it's still mm-hmm. one player. So people had very high expectations even for this year's Fnatic. And one of the things we've seen in some of the problems Fnatic has had is it looks like at times they've had problems with basic macro concepts. Looks like they've used a lot of Band-Aid fixes with like early game setups, etc. And from talking to some of the players, from talking even to Youngbuck, they kind of implied that like, they didn't realize until Caps left, like what he brought to the team, basically, like communication, kind of just his playing style means you're naturally going to kind of follow up on things he does. He's going to somehow, he's going to skew the way the game's played if you have Caps in the game. Like, what would you say to that angle? Like the system last year, a lot <clears throat> of based along funneling resources into kill setups on mid. That was basically the entire identity of the team throughout like Summer Split. Um, Hilly, one of the best roaming supports in the world. Uh, Caps, sure. one of the best like kill threat matchup players um in the world reckless one of the best like safe adc players in the world like it, it all kind of worked together so mm-hmm. we had a system kind of based around that so yeah when you take out the person you're funneling the kind of pressure into it's gonna be hard to kind of fix it but that doesn't mean they have bad players now right all their players sure. are still some of the best players in the world so yeah uh i think it was hard for them at first also i think they struggled right at the start of spring, but they also yes. took a lot of time off. Like it, it's really natural. Like they needed a break, and they took a more a lot more time off, I think, than a lot of the other teams. So I think it was natural for them for to lose some games at the start. Okay, right, and then along similar mm-hmm. lines, obviously, someone who's gotten a lot of criticism in the new Fnatic lineup is Broxa for similar reasons, which is yeah. as soon as Caps wasn't there people felt like he got a bit exposed. I know some of the analysts, even before then, used to think he was like a bit overrated. Like they thought he just kind of farmed up and then just went to the lane he was supposed to go do to get the gank. Like they didn't feel as though, like I've noticed when people rate junglers, they have a natural bias to the guy who like, he's the mastermind. He knows everywhere he wants to go. He tells his laners, I'm coming. They, it's that type of a player that they prefer. So what would you say to Brox as someone as knowing him as a person and a player? I think um, he w- was a very good teammate, very good at, uh, following like the direction of the team, following the direction of the coaching staff and um, his mid laner and what needed to be done. Um, 
And I think that's really, really important to have players like this that can kind of like kind of complete you know, your system. Mm -hmm. um, I also think he's really good on his champions. Um, and I think he's still like, people might say he's overrated, but he must be one of the absolute best junglers in Europe. Like, I, I think anyone who thinks he's like a weak player is just really not watching the games or something. Oh, there's a few uh, out there that are very vocal yeah, about that. Yeah, I, I know, but I don't know what games they're watching. Like, uh, mm -hmm. I said the exact same thing. I don't know what games <laughs> like, you're watching. Yeah, like, like you watch the games, the split that he's playing, like, what is he, is he playing bad? Like maybe mm -hmm. the Karthus game was not that great the other weekend, but it's just like one game. I'll tell you um, the logical game, because so the logic isn't that he plays bad, as far as I know. Like maybe fans yeah. say that, I don't know. The people I know are analysts. Their argument is this. This is the reason why they criticized him even in the mm -hmm. 2018 lineup that was winning everything. What they yeah. say is, right, he's, he's good for Fnatic. Like he does a good job in this Fnatic team and did with the last setup. Their logic is that he doesn't push it as far as he can. Like you were saying about Caps before, like put playing to your absolute limits to be the best player you can be. To them, there's moments in the game where Broxa could do more. Like if it, they would say, if you, I'll give you an example from LEC. They would say if you had self-made there or someone along these lines, they would, or Jankos is an obvious example, they would push the limits a lot more, whereas Caps is more no, sort of mm -hmm. rocks around yeah, but, going along with the game. Wait, no, no, there's but a more extreme one. Of wait, the whole duh, game, like one, one more. Kadril would do better than what Broxa is doing. That's like the, that was the blatantly outlandish one that I heard. By the way, I'll tell you right now, Loco. Mm -hmm. Kelsey Moser thinks that. Veteran thinks that. I'm sure they Bilal do. Bilal thinks that. Loads of people who I consider way more knowledgeable than you think that. So you can laugh for you Kedro, want to I'm sure. Kadro and Veteran, <laughs> right, not Kadro and Veteran, Kelsey and Veteran work with Kadro. They have a bias towards it. I think it's such a ludicrous statement. Like, Yeah, the, just, the people just, that work with them yeah. think, think he would do better, but then the games I see Obvious Broxa bias. And, and yeah, my mistake, Loco, because obviously Dylan didn't well, fucking work with Broxy, you idiot. Think it I'm what sure, you yeah. So there's bias on both sides. That's no, exactly what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, fucking hell. I, it's Matt obvious. Lies. There's bias Great on argument. both sides. Yeah, yeah the, there's bias. You think Dylan's bias, but you don't think Kelsey and Veteran no. is it biased towards that? Don't, don't ever try and read my mind. You can't even read. Wait, so you don't think? Mind, so mind. you don't think so, Kelsey and Veteran are biased? You can keep to, using mm -hmm. like your fucking third grade like reverse know, psychology sure. to try and get me to say what you want to say. I'm not going to do it. So it's Dylan, not third grade psychology. You're saying Dylan's bias? Wait. Wait, you're saying Dylan's biased towards Broxa because Dylan worked with Broxa. I'm telling you the I exact same thing. thing no, but no would... shit, Professor. That's the point I just made to you. Yes, that's ex that's the exact same point. You're saying, what is it? Kelsey and Veteran are saying Kadro can be better and they no, are no, biased. No, no, that's okay. not what I said, right? So right, again, what's your, what's for some the... reason, right? I guess for all the kids out there who have no social cues whatsoever, I'll act like the fucking subtitles of the episode. Go ahead. And when Loco laughs, I'll say Loco laughing mm -hmm. and I'll explain everything that just happened. So what happened was, Lo you you guys were setting it up like, huh, and there's, there's all these analysts that think mm -hmm. he's like not even that good. Are they even watching the game? You didn't say they have an actual buy. You go, are they even watching the game? As though they're like idiots who can't even see what's happening on the screen. And they I'm, know nothing about League of Legends apparently. That's listen, what it seems like. Listen, I'm, I'm listening listening. now. I let, I let you speak a second mm -hmm. ago. And when they did this, right, you you didn't give a single reason as to why they'd be wrong. You didn't give a single point in favor of Broxer. All you said was, mm -hmm. What do you know? They think Kedro, and you know what? They've worked with Kedro. That was your only reason against him. No, that was him. not my only Listen, reason against him. Local Doka, you know nothing about Kedro. You know fuck all about his games. Oh you my fell man. apart when Kelsey <laughs> Moses started asking you. And even on Broxton, right, the only point go. you made repeatedly mm -hmm. was his performance is better. That is a meaningless statement. You have to give more than that. So listen, mm -hmm. well, the problem is you set it up that that was the reason why they don't know anything because they mm -hmm. worked with Kedro. So obviously they'd be biased. My Wait, point okay. was it's not a mm -hmm. good argument to make because in this case, the person we're now asking to mm -hmm. defend Broxer, which I hope he does in a second, has mm -hmm. his own exact same bias. That's obvious, right? Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean that either of them are wrong. I would actually imagine personally that they're all looking at a different perspective of the same puzzle. Mm -hmm. And some of them are more biased to certain factors. Like I said before, mm -hmm. some people prefer junglers who are aggressive, mm -hmm. like fucking Kakao or something. Some people mm -hmm. prefer someone like Scorn, who's just a pathing jungler mm -hmm. people have different preferences mate that's fine my point here is don't dismiss people who definitely know a lot about league of legends as all their scrubs what i mean i can dismiss their opinion when i think it's blatantly wrong like i'll dismiss it 24 7 it's just blatantly wrong no, to say, well, no i just did and i continue will doing so like it's i think it's ludicrous to say Kadro could replace right, say it 700 times mate Dorn, if, you're gonna, time I, you if you're gonna if you're gonna complain about me interrupting you i'll try my best to not interrupt you make sure you do the same like i think it's ludicrous kiss my ass Kiss my ass. I think it's ludicrous to fake Kedro. You've interrupted me about 700 times when I was even saying, don't interrupt me. You still kept going, nah, 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 nah. It's like, I can't get four words out. So the point is this, mm -hmm. right? This is what makes no sense about what you're um, arguing about right now. You still haven't made a single point. All you do is react like a 14-year-old girl <laughs> doing a reaction video. Like, I can't believe it. 
I can't believe it. It's like, what can't you believe? I can't believe it. It's like, how about give a point? It's an analysis show. You know, you could crush these guys, local, if you think they know nothing. Mm-hmm. Actually make points that fucking crush them. Make a point that I watched Kedro, actually. Like, I'll give you a reason mm-hmm. I even told Veteran to his face why I think the Kedro example is overrated. Mm-hmm. Because he's doing that from theory. He mm-hmm. knows that Kedro's a smart guy and can break the game down. My point is, I've seen Kedro play. I think he would break down in a top team. I don't think he has the mentality for it. I don't think he would shot call mm-hmm. all the best players in the world around the map. I think it's a lot easier when you've got a bunch of shitters mm-hmm. who've never been in LEC before. So I'm definitely not somebody you can dismiss in that way because mm-hmm. I make points, mate, and I don't even follow the fucking game. So how about you when you watch these games? Mm-hmm. Maybe scribble an idea down, come up with an actual motherfucking point. Just don't tell me your opinion 700 times in a row, dude. We've got to actually analyze the oh, game sure. on the show. Duncan, I made those points before. Like, I brought up examples of Cato making mechanical mistakes and very simple gank setups and Brock right. not being able to execute those really well. So... And I brought up examples of Broxa in the early four weeks, how he's there at the right places, ready to counter gank. The ganks he's doing, he's playing towards the right lanes, he's enabling the right people in the team, like most notably Whipple. Like, these are points that I made. I didn't just give my opinion, like, his performance is better. There's definitely analytical points I gave on top of that. You didn't do it on this show, mate. So right I, now it's irrelevant. Dylan mm-hmm. wasn't watching that fucking show. He doesn't know what points you made, mate. I, I was... Honestly, I was trying to do it on this show, and then we just kept interrupting each other back and forth. That's why I didn't get to make those points. Right, here's another point to make as well, right? Unless mm-hmm. you've got some straight fire direction, don't go down cul-de-sacs and remain down there, circling round and round and round, noticing that there's no way out. I gave you about mm-hmm. four, four or five ways out of this 10 minutes ago where we could have actually asked his opinion. So can you give us your thoughts? Obviously, try and ignore all that fucking unpleasantness if you can. <laughs> Just, it's like local door call when Reginald used to come in and they'd lost mm-hmm. the fucking game and he was telling people how to, what boots to buy. Ignore that. Just The boss got a bit mad. Right, yeah. what, do you, what do you think about Broxa then? Give, your, um, give us your defense uh, if you can, please. I would, I would say... Actually, I'll, I'll devil's advocate for a second. Kedril's actually had a, a lot of pop-off games the past few weeks. He's played quite well. Uh, I think XL is a much better team than their record shows. Sure. Um, and, they, and he's been playing quite good. Like, yeah. I do not think Kedril... He definitely deserves to be playing in LEC, and I'm sure with better laners, he would do much better because that's kind of how the jungle role works. Mm-hmm. But I, I just think Broxa is just like really, really solid player. I also don't think that this um, obsession with junglers who take huge risks and make crazy dives in coin flip games is what any absolute top tier team really wants out of their jungler. I think having someone like Selfmade or Maxlor, like it looks good sometimes but it really is not good for actually being a good team um the game i feel like right now is so objective focused herald is so important dragon is so important like vision is so important contesting mid waves together with your mid laner is important that like just psych- psychopath jungling is not good i, I don't think Kedro really is that but mm-hmm. like that's not my approach to the jungle also mm-hmm. Like, Brox is playing pretty aggressive these days. I think one thing you could criticize Brox on is the pass. He definitely was more on the passive side. Absolutely. If his Krugs are up, he wants to do his Krugs and get his XP. Um, and That's farm. what Kay said. Also, what is it? Overfocus yeah. on farming. Okay, so yeah. the biggest, I guess, counterpoint to um, psychopathic jungling is wasn't Ning that exact player when IG won Worlds, where they would take fight over fight over fight, where they would be pure <clears throat> aggression at all costs? Yeah. Um, I guess, uh, but there was some amount of thought to it, I think. Mm-hmm. Like, they were still contesting mid together really hard. And right, it's never very, black and white, drafting. where it's just like, they were like drafting for mid to be too constantly and playing around it, and he was playing with his mid laner, no? Mm-hmm. I mean, of I'm course, sure, like, I mean, of course, like, it's not like you have zero thoughts and you're always like being psychopathic, full aggressive, or you're always yeah. being analytical. But I would definitely say Ning leaned way more towards like pure aggression than he did towards like brainy plays and being strategic. Yeah, but it also leads to sets where they lose zero three to TL no. And definitely, sure. but it also leads to like world <laughs> like, victories, like to see. Yeah, like, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Of course, of course, of course. Sure. I, I'm just that's not what I would value in a player personally. Okay. Um, yeah. Just personal preference. That's fine. Yeah, and uh, yeah, I, I don't think I have any other. I think I made sense. No, here's the thing. I would say about Ning on that one. Like, I agree. I would assume in his team. I would assume he, Ning's like the fucking caps of jungle and they're just like, right, this is the guy's strength, this is how he plays the game, let's play around it, let's use it where we can. I don't personally know how much like Ning actually, like I personally suspect if you put Ning, just like MLXG on any team, I think they do that all the time anyway. I think that's just who they are as players. I think they just, that's just their vision for the jungle. Like if you've ever seen MLXG, this is the guy who would be lose kills in the jungle and still be looking for some crazy gank that should never work ever. But if you pull it off, you win the whole game off it. So. 
And I, I, I think that was just personal preference. I know what you mean. There's always going to be a bias towards like highlight players who seem like they're very individually yeah. strong. That's that's the case. I think to me though, it's just what team you have. Like for me, every team. Should, this is one of the reasons why I personally don't believe in the concept of like the coach decides the style of a team because from what I've seen in team sports, including like traditional sports, it's the other way around. You look at the personnel that you have, you go, right, well, I've got this top player now and this mid, and then from that, you can almost like infer what the style would make more sense on the current meta. It's not like you sit down and go, right, I think I'm going to play through top. Do we have Huni? No. Nope. Oh, well, I'm fucked then, right? I only have Dyrus, right? No, you, you play around that if you've got Huni. Like, there's no yeah, point playing then, all, you know, makes sense to me. Anyway, the other side to this is, um, do you see where any of the criticism of Brox have come from this year then, or do you think they're old narratives from last year or something? Um, spring split? Obviously, they had the start where they were playing super bad. Um, I think there were many games where Brox was pretty AFK. Yeah, I think he can definitely deserve some criticism from it, and he deserves it. And uh, obviously, Fnatic went for the whole sub situation and really re-looked at how they're playing the game for Summer Split. It's very clear when you watch their games. And it seems like because he is a good player, um, he fixed it and he's playing super good in Summer Split so far. Um, I think they've been struggling as a team in the past few weeks for sure, but I think Brox overall in Summer Split has been playing playing good, yeah. But I think okay. they, they fix it. Like they, it's very clear that they put an effort into fixing it with the whole sub situation and focusing on aggressive play and all of this. And Brox is like skipping camps 24 7, going to volatile lanes, ganking a lot. Um, so, yeah. But I, I think, yeah, for especially Spring Split, some of the criticism is warranted. Mm. Okay. All right, well, another person, uh, well, listen, after this, we'll just do the normal show where we talk about each team, everyone gives their thoughts. Yeah. It's not like an interview format. But another question I had actually about Fnatic, because it's relevant to now is uh since you said actually when you first the season seven team the one where you first got into the squad as the coach and that was before caps had the system developed where he was a fantastic player in the same way he is now at the time as you said the basically the carry lane was bottling it was carry through yep. reckless and actually people don't know this because people spend all their time asking me about the periods when i criticize reckless that is my favorite reckless season because that is the season where he was absolutely the best AD carry and he was hard carrying the fuck out of some of those games. Like those MVPs were totally deserved, even if his team didn't win the championship. So this this was like a different type of reckless though. The reckless in some of the past teams wasn't that type of player. Did was it did he want to do this? Did did someone come up with the concept? How did this this reckless emerge? Because obviously it's gone again. Now he's they they've sort of gone back to a style where it looks like they play through top half the time now. Um at least when I joined the team, that style was already something that they had created, I think probably created by Reckless. Um, I wasn't there for the actual creation of it. It was just basically based off of like kill setup spot lane. Um, and you would just get the most obnoxious kill setup bot lane, like Camille support, Kennen. You would gank like crazy, like over and over and over again, trap in bushes, hide, cheesy ganks, cheesy jungle pass, fake leashes, whatever it took to just get kills. Um, and then he would just go side. Everyone would take teleport or roaming champions. And then the way like macro works in League of Legends, right, is if you are playing primarily through the side lane with two to three people, like the, the, if that's how you're kind of trying to pressure the map, um, it puts yourself in an awkward spot where when the team goes mid, you get kind of cut off and it creates basically a big fight. So everyone would take TP, be playing roaming champions, and there'd be big giant fights on side lane with Reckless. Everyone would TP in, everyone would do everything, and he would end up getting super fed and like carrying the game even harder. It was a really weird way of playing. Um, some teams still use something like this every once in a while. Like it, there's a time and a place for this for sure. Still, mm -hmm. um, but it was a very different way of playing. Yeah. So, okay. can, yeah, go on there, local. I never personally worked with <laughs> Reckless, and a common criticism is he doesn't have like the it factor in terms of being like I'm a hard carry. Like I want the resources. Like give me the ball. I'll make the final shot. Like how much of that is like just Reddit speculation, and how much of that is like actually who Reckless is as a person? But we're in, we're in comps like almost built around him for most of his career in the last two years. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, maybe there's like the end of the Caps era where Akali and Aatrox and Irelia were the most broken champs I've ever seen in my life. But Spring Split was him and on Wickle as well. So it, it was him on Tristana carrying, carrying the games. No, Car uh, Caps played Karma mid in our Spring Split finals when we won. And he got Pentakill game one, I think, Pentakill game two. And the comps were basically built around him carrying. Mm -hmm. Like maybe he doesn't play some of the lane stomp champions, but is like Kaylin and Lucian even that good throughout most of the two the past two or three years? Probably not. I would say the general, like if you asked, let's say like thousand people that watch the LEC, like the general consensus would be like Reckless is a passive player. Like Reckless isn't like a hard carry. I think that is a very, 
it maybe not a truthful statement, but a very common statement. Um, I mean, put it this way, the problem here, local, is when you say the word passive, unfortunately, to people in League of Legends, that automatically has a negative connotation and they think passive means scared or whatever. I would just say it more like this. If you look at Reckless over his career, aside from when he got Hillasan, he often didn't play with like very strong supports in the lane. In mm -hmm. fact, players like Yellow Star just rolled all the time. So to be fair, he was never set up in those teams to be the carry. And he certainly seemed to be on board with that as well. He had amazing solos in the past teams. So I don't know if like, it's fair to say passive entirely in that sense. Like that is something from years ago, but I do I'm not think saying it's true. Think, I'm, no, no, but I think, I, I think like it's just, I don't think the contrast is passive or hard carry, but I mm. certainly think most people would say he's not like a super hard carry. Now, again, to Dylan's point, even this year, I would say when they got it together in spring, he was the player carrying pretty much. Yeah, I think it's a bit of a meme, honestly. Like <clears throat> I don't really, I don't really see it as, as passive. He has good KDAs, I guess. He doesn't die um, in the games and he, knows when enemy has kill threat on him and would like the draft and the situations mm -hmm. for the game in a way where there's not a high threat of him like dying or him being in a hard hard spot but i don't know like i, I don't see him as a safer passive player especially when he's on his comfort champions i don't think this is necessarily true i think it's honestly a bit of a meme because season five he was permanent weak side that was Huni Rain over, right? Or season six? Sure. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, season, season five. five. Season six was the year it went really bad. Season five, perma weak side. Rain over Huni 24 7. Season 7, he's literally permanently getting camped for the entire split and, and carrying. They didn't have Next year after that, then, spring obviously. split, it's, it's farm meta. He's playing his champions and he's the primary carry of the team with comps like Karma mid in finals. Um, and then, yeah, I, I guess at Worlds, when it was Irelia and Akali running around one shotting people, he has to play safe champs last year, but like seems pretty like a good idea at the time. I mean, to throw in there, I would give the devil's advocate that if you're going to make all those cases, like ignoring the early part of his career, because who the fuck has time to go back half a decade for the sake of talking about 2019? We'll just look at the recent yeah. seasons. You could say, for example, I think part of why this mentality has developed is, aside from the old narratives, which did apply, I think, years ago, in season eight summer, well, we didn't even see him for the first few weeks, mate, because he benched himself because he refused to play any of the mages. And if for some <laughs> reason, even though your boy Han Sammer was in there all day playing Eddie Carries, he was just sat on the bench. So people see that. That is where people do think, what is he a pussy? Is he just scared of little what? what is it, does he not want to show himself looking bad when he's not in good shape? What would you say to that? Um, I think it's complicated and it's a lot more to do with probably the inner workings of Fnatic than it is just on Reckless's strengths or weaknesses as a player, especially if Hilly's roaming around the map 24 seven, there's certain champs that um, are better for this. Like for example, they're playing a lot of Karma these days and he's playing a lot of Karma and then Hilly just roams around the map on Pike, killing everybody. Makes sense. Yeah. Um, so I think it's kind of because of that. Uh, I, I think I think Perk said this as well, when he's not on his really comfort or his champions, it, it generally goes the more passive route. I, I think that's fair. Fair, whether it's criticism, I don't think it's necessarily criticism, but I think it's a fair statement. Mm. No, here's the thing. This is always going to be the problem with players like Bjergsen, Reckless, Froggen. The problem is because they're not bad. No one's saying they're bad. No one's arguing like, this player's garbage, get him off the LEC. The problem is people who like them want them to be the best. So we're not yeah. talking about like, is he bad? Is, is it passive? Is he positive? What we're asking is, is he as good as the absolute best AD carries? In this case, I guess the fair comparison is only the West. Like it's not really fair to compare Korean things because who the fuck knows even what their systems are? We, we, had, we have no idea how they set the teams up. But people look at him, like the obvious example, and I will say it's the reason why comparing him to Uzi Ai is a bit unreasonable is Uzi Ai has the, is, has, is like the caps of ADC, has the most extreme mm -hmm. playing style you could almost fucking have as an AD carry. So like, I don't think, like, put it this way, Doublelift isn't like Uzi Ai. Doublelift looks passive no, compared no, to Uzi Nobody Ai. plays the game like they played the game. They do things where they'll just like split the map for bot side, like counter pick range support with range support, split the map, everything goes into bot side. The second you show on top side, you're getting four man dove. Their support's playing like Gragas and Thresh, like an absolute maniac. Like, yeah, of, of course, like, there aren't players in the West that play the game like this, but does that mean they're a better or worse player? I'm not sure. Like, RNG ended up losing in the end of it, right, at Worlds. So sure. I, the strategy isn't the greatest. Going back to Reckliff, where I feel like the narrative changed around him, and I guess a little bit of my viewpoint changed around him, was he used to be very vocal regarding social media and regarding what he says in an interview and just in general he was just old. just say on uh maybe on stream and on on thing because by the way i don't know if you know this local but mm. so like reckless has an account that follows zero people and i don't, I don't know if he's ever tweeted he might tweet like no, five no. times in his life so he <laughs> no it wasn't like that at all he used to tweet 
he used to tweet like a normal pro player. Like he used to say his thoughts after game, and then there was a sudden change where he unfollowed everyone, and then he would only type GG afterwards, and then he would have one big statement after the split, and he also used to do big Facebook posts after every split on like what he thought was the problem, like how he felt about the split, like he used to be much more open-ended. And then he changed, I think it was a little bit after the elements, I can't pinpoint the exact timeline, but he became really reclusive in terms of outward facing to the media and to the fans. I'm not sure if he changed like within the team or if that's just how he chose to deal with media, but there was a change. He wasn't always I like mean, that. listen, obviously by the timeline you've just set up, Dylan all is going to have to say again, well, I wasn't mm -hmm. there during that time, so I can't mm -hmm. really say what's... But, so, but so here's the question instead then, Dylan. Can you give us some insight into who Reckless is as a person? I mean, all, um, people, all, people don't see much from him. They don't see a lot of interviews with him. Yeah. Another example would be there's all that memories in people's minds of him crying when he was at Worlds moments when he had disappointments or didn't go the way. So who, he seems like a complicated person. Who is he? Yeah, uh, like he, I think he's just really, really perfectionist. Um, he wants him and his teammates to really like be the best and not make mistakes and be be perfect. He will wake up every single morning early, go to the gym, eat like the same healthy meals, play solo queue from when he wakes up to when he goes to sleep. He's just incredibly disciplined and really just focused on himself and focused on the game. Um, and and that's it, like he, he's very one dimensional and focused on one thing and that's that's league. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, whereas Caps, for Caps, just to kind of compare, it's more of a passion thing. Like he's so passionate about league, he just wants to play it all day, every day, because he just loves the game and everything about it excites him. For Reckless, it's more of this same kind of coin, but the other side, it's very serious. Mm -hmm. Doran, don't you remember when like Reckless used to fight with Freeze on Twitter? Like he used to be vocal on Twitter. Like he wasn't always like uh, that. A little bit, a little bit. Now he's just I like think that a, was a rare uh, example. Now it's just a I, ghost I Twitter where someone else runs it. But he wasn't always like this. That's like my main point. Like there was a sudden shift at like a certain moment. Like he used to be public about things on Facebook. Sure. Ah, uh, I think maybe if if he posted more on Twitter, uh, he would he would be better in in LEC or something. <laughs> no, I'm just maybe, saying. Maybe that's that's the missing point is the Twitter posts, you know. No, no, but I would say I, I actually think vaguely local has a point here. What what local means, as far as I can tell, is if you're some like this is something I tell players all the time. If players ever complain to me like you're saying all these narratives about me that I don't think are right, I'm like. Well, then what are you going to do about it? Just sit there and do nothing. Like mm -hmm. you can either do a video yourself or you could write a blog post mm -hmm. explaining, you know, why I'm wrong. Or, or for example, you don't even have to address it. Just say reasons that you aren't like that. Or you could come on a show and have a great discussion and give some insight. So the problem is since Reckless closes himself mm -hmm. off in that way, I think the only person he doesn't use with is maybe Travis. Some, obviously, Travis he does them on. Yeah. Uh, he occasionally streams and even then he just kind of answers the questions that seem like the nice ones generally so people don't know the guy that's the problem so they don't know the yeah. other side like, I actually think it sometimes if you know someone's personality their playing style makes a lot more sense mm. I, I think yeah. play style definitely reflects personality on like the players coming on show like, I, mean, I would love it when players come on shows but like as a coach and as someone like that competed and competitive wouldn't the advice from like the player perspective be ignore everything and then just focus and f fuck the narrative I just mute the cast, don't read anything, and don't come on shows usually. I, I guess I'm right now, but that generally that's my approach. You're probably regretting it after that first 20 minutes, to be fair. But, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, uh, I, as like a show host, of course I would like it if players just were more open and they came on shows and they talked. But like from a com competitive aspect, if like what I say is bothering you, what Doran is saying is bothering you, like as a coach, my advice would be just mute. Like don't look at yeah. Twitter, don't look at Reddit, just play. Like that's, what's, that's what, what good is it going to well, do throughout most of the split? I think it's a lot better for performance, and if it's what Reckless chooses to do, then I think it's fine. And he's a very serious, professional person, and sure. whatever I think. Here's the thing I would say on that topic. Mm -hmm. I personally, this is something people don't know. I personally don't recommend players trash talk. I actually tell most players like. If you have to ask the question, oh, should I trash talk? You, the answer is probably no, because you're like uncertain about it. If you're the sort of person you should trash talk, it's probably because that's just who you are as a person. Like you're a super outgoing person, maybe like, because the key to me with trash talk is not only can it obviously backfire, like I said it there, so you'd come on and explain everything. Well, maybe you did explain it badly and you'd mm -hmm. come off looking like an idiot. That's certainly happened before. But I would say even more than that, if you're going to trash talk, you have to be the kind of player who it doesn't affect you. Like there's players I know in CSGO and League of Legends, they could trash talk all they want and they'll play the same no matter what. That's why it works, because maybe they can get the opponent. 
but there's also players I've known in many games who've tried the trash talk and then that ends up making them worse because now they're thinking about that or they're losing to the person they said they were going to crash in the game. It's making them play. So I think it can definitely be like a knife edge as to which way that goes. You've got to be very careful that you're on the right side of it, in my opinion. I mean, anyway. Tra trash talking is a double-edged sword. I think all anyway. three of us know oh, that's, so. that's local classic, no? <laughs> It is a local classic. I, I yeah. would assume loco is the sort of coach who just says everything's a double-edged sword because there's actually a famous joke that says even a double-edged sword is a double-edged sword because you've got the double-edged sword and then you've got the side that's, you know... So it's, it's, it's a pretty bad fucking joke, but whatever. It's, it's local sort of humour. So here mm. we go. By the way, loco, can I just say, as an aside, yeah. you, if you don't want these things to happen, mate, don't tweet. You did tweet a fucking hilarious tweet where, what did where I say? you tweeted at Lisa Duan, the girl who came on that episode of this show. Oh, and you were like, and you were like, oh, I was, I was trying to call you, like, uh -huh. and talk to you last night, okay. and she was like, yeah, yeah, sorry, love, I was just about, I was just about to go to bed, so I couldn't uh -huh. answer. It's like you sounded like the most. I did not. Motherfucker. I, okay. Ever. All right. First of all, I don't care if you think Lisa and I are friend zone because we're just friends, and that's it. And yeah, exactly. But, that's, how, that's what people in friend zone always say. I. <laughs> Oh my God. No, actually, yeah, I'm just friends. Am I wrong? Am I wrong? No. Right. Exactly, just let's let it go, just let it go. Right, okay, let's just move on to the next point. I'm, yeah, not, I'm, not, not, gonna, I'm not gonna go some, into this one. Yeah, some of them are just jokes. Uh, I'm not so gonna, gonna go into this. Just let the jokes fly by. You know, I'm let those go on. by like a, wind, a, a leaf in the wind. You don't have to grab onto all of them. So anyway, <laughs> oh. wait, obviously there's one more team, I guess we have to ask specifically you about, which is your own team, Schalke now. Get a little yeah. insight there. Then we'll then we'll talk about the other squads. Let me, So, can I start with this one for the Schalke one? For the Schalke one, I actually watched the most recent two Schalke games. You guys play like a North American team. You guys draft side laners. You guys don't win side lane. You guys didn't win side, side lane with Kled. You guys didn't win side lane with Aatrox. And you guys just keep getting forced into team fighting at objectives because you aren't able to play side lanes because your side <coughs> lanes aren't winning. Your solo lanes aren't winning. Mm, well, there was what? Are you, you mean the two games from last weekend? Yeah, two games from last weekend. First game, Kled game, what was our mid lane? It was is zero, I think. Yes, I want to say it's zero. Yeah, uh, I, I suppose if enemy mid is dying under his turret level three and mm -hmm. then die going zero six on Echo, and then but his response to that is to keep pushing the side lane all the way to tier two and suiciding to us, mm -hmm. then we will not have pressure in one of our side lanes. Oh, I, and, okay. that's a fair statement, but I, I don't think that's like fair criticism for that game. Wait, um, let's go back to that game for that game. Yeah. You guys crafted. Kled and Sejuani, wouldn't you say like one of the primary win conditions that you're trying to get out of picking a Kled Sejuani is getting the Kled ahead and that being one of your like main win conditions. Like we're constantly pushing side lanes, they have to send multiple people. When they send multiple people, we can match it with Kled and the Sejuani and win the 2v2s. Yeah, I, I think that probably would have been better for early game in that game. Um, I think we chose to split the map for bot side. I think we invaded their blue buff no. Mm -hmm. And we just did a, a bot for top map split. We also... I think in this game, valued a lot getting um, our like our Zaya, was Zaya Rakan was it in that game out of lane? Uh, uh, with no, it was Siver oh, and um, Siver and the Morgana. I'm, I'm actually actually mixing up two games. I think uh, this is one where we die level one bot lane, right? Mm -hmm. And yeah, in, in that game, I think top two two is <coughs> win condition. I think that criticism is probably pretty valid. Mm -hmm. Um, I put it this way, here's a less like analytical version of that, which is something people often say about yeah. Sharkers. I'll get your take on it. Basically, in the spring, Sorry, up, like... yeah, it's all right. In the spring, when the team started well and then was dropping off, one of the things I noticed was most analysts actually never criticized Dodo Amni much. They all thought he was still a very good top laner, but their criticism was it looked like you guys didn't know you had a fifth player in the server. Like you, you the rest of the map existed and then Odo Amni just lives in the top. He's like the old school, like 10 years ago, where it was like, you're on an island, mate. See ya. See ya, Robinson Crusoe. Um, like, I think that's fair criticism of our team. I think in spring split, a lot more of the issues had to do with just mid jungle synergy and how our mid jungle worked together. Um, I think that was probably our biggest weakness for sure and what caused us to kind of drop in the standings um and i think this split teams are playing a lot more aggressively around top lane than us yeah i'd say it's something like we've looked at a lot in our reviews it's something that we're working on for sure but also going bot when you have one of the better bot lanes in the league or best bot lanes in the league i would say mm -hmm. comes with its own strengths too so it's kind of like a, a balancing act for sure mm. sure okay along those lines then uh, for, for context, Norco didn't mention it earlier when he was talking about this, but you came into the coaching game from a jungle perspective. I remember you did those videos where it was like jungle yeah. path and you came into TSM, you were coaching on that angle. And so obviously, 
I want to ask specifically about the younger role in Schalke because you started out and you had a mentor and he was mm -hmm. someone where I've even admitted this myself. I think I actually overestimated him as a player because the problem is when he was on the bad rock art teams, he was the only good thing about them. So he would do similar to like he did in your team. He would get nice early leads. He'd set up the map yeah. right. And then when it would fail, I would just think, well, he's on fucking rock art, isn't he? Like he hasn't got any good players. But the problem is when he came to Schalke, a lot of the same issues seem to sort of exist in this team. So what would you say about that? Because if you're someone coming from a specific like positional background, I'm assuming you have a lot of influence or someone you're in constant communication with the jungle, right? I heard so constant nice things about Dylan. Like whenever, whichever team Dylan coach, one thing that was always consistent is Dylan's really good at setting up pathing and Dylan's really good at planning early game around jungle. All right, anyways, go ahead. Yeah, uh, I think that a lot of our struggles in like the game right now is played a lot of it through mid jungle as a duo, right? Like mid pro is the most important in the game. Um, having your mid laner being able to move gives you the most pressure of the map of every single lane. Um, the champions are generally drafted as combos or with the matchup like 2v2 really heavily in mind. And I think a lot of the, the issue is just when you have a rookie, uh, for example, in the mid lane last split, um, we just weren't able to, at least I wasn't able to teach. And as a team, we weren't able to kind of teach a system in which they could work together productively in draft and in game and to kind of like play the game correctly. And I actually think as an individual player, Memento is easily LEC level, if not one, if not like upper LEC level as far as individual skill. It just, it really didn't work with uh, a rookie mid laner that had a lot to learn who I think Abba's got like insane mechanics. One of the more promising players I've seen in the past couple of years, but like it just didn't work. And I think that's why with Trick, someone who won four EULCS splits in a row with perks, like, and got MVP twice, he just has that knowledge and leadership and ability to kind of just fix it. And I, I think he, he mostly has. Like obviously, he did play with Ignar when he was in Korea, so I'm assuming he was able to yeah. give you some insight. But were you not scared at all of the fact that this guy was basically in the trash can of Turkey and then you guys pulled him out and brought him to LEC? Isn't that a gamble? I, I heard stories of him playing with like a Diamond 380 carry in one of his professional matches. Like, like, and stuff Local, like that. what the fuck were you doing playing in the Turkish game? <laughs> <laughs> I, also, <laughs> also really one, one thing I would imagine is Shake was like, they're not going to get someone like, proven and they're not going to get someone that's like sure. oh my god like i'm top tier like they're gonna have no, to take but a to risk be fair like the reason i said it up like mm -hmm. that local is it's not like there's not jungle talent in europe like there's plenty in the national leagues who are very good players you've seen them already in, L in lcs already like inspired think about um what's his name fucking dan who's on uh, fanatic looked pretty decent kiri looked all right for me like there's plenty of talent out there so it is a gamble in my opinion to bring a korean into like a non-korean team in that way but he's already won four splits in a row last times he was in Europe. Like, I sure. didn't really see it as that much of a gamble. Like, of course, like, it, I had to see some amount of him playing with the team and stuff. Like, and it would have been an issue if he was super bad. But I really didn't think this was a realistic option for sure. And well, Ignar had this? super good things to say about him as, okay. as well as a player. And yeah. Since, as you alluded to earlier, like 2v2 is a key matchup. And since you kept saying rookie mid laner, what, like, what people have to understand is it's very rare you're going to get someone like Perks, some of these players that come in and just from day one, they're among the best and they're just doing amazingly. Part of the reason is like when people come in, they're going to be a little bit more quiet. They're not going to ask to be the main fucking carry the whole team. They're not going to have even maybe the mentality to be the best player. So in if in a, with a player like Abedaga, did he need someone who was going to lead a little bit more and he could kind of like, they could, they could help him in that sense? Yeah, for sure. And, and for Abba, he's not... Um... It, he, he's kind of a quiet person like he's, sure. he's a very kind of quiet personality but it took many months i think for us to realize that he's actually a carry player like for sure like this guy okay. plays assassins. he wants to play play for kill he wants to take over the game but just i think partially his personality and synergy with with the team right away it didn't really work out but at the same time whenever it was like team fights and skirmishes you could see like he's really gifted uh like mechanically so yeah, I just so basically one Sandra then. <laughs> yeah, no, but I think that was a big mistake. Like sure. in retrospect, I thought that was like really, really nice. bad on my part, for example, and a mistake I made and something I think we've done a lot better at in summer split is just not playing like Lissandra like eight games in a row. When I don't that actually feels like uh, yeah. like that actually feels like you made the mistake yourself of what you said earlier about players playing to their limits. Like you saw him and thought, 
uh, he's having issues or, you know, he's having trouble knowing where to go. Just put him on Lissandra. Like, that's, unfortunately, that's why players who like Lissandra, Malzai, you get like a stigma if you're that type of player, if you get put on it by your team, right? Yeah, it, it wasn't the right decision for the time. And it's, I think we're doing a lot better. Also, like, Trick, when he came to the team, studied VODs with Abba for like an hour or two hours every single scrim day for like an okay. entire month. Like, mm -hmm. the amount of effort that they put into improving themselves as a duo was like really, really a lot. So, fair yeah. enough. Oh, we should obviously, before we move on, like, since you said before, you think you have one of the best bot lanes in the league. I'll I'll put some other criticism that comes from other players, okay? So the interesting thing here is, this is the criticism that Veteran always says about upset, but he doesn't really say it as like pure criticism. Again, it's mm -hmm. contrasting against the absolute best player at the position. And basically, yeah. and by the way, I'll tell you, he actually likes upset, he's a, he's a fan of his game. But his what he always says is, the, the reason why he prefers other players at the moment at AD Carry is upset is the player where if his team isn't ahead, He's probably not gonna like take over the game. Like he's not the guy where if he's behind, he's gonna make like some hero play, like engage a fight, like take over the whole. He's, it's more like he goes with the team in that sense. What do you think? But he's playing AD carry, no? He is, but <laughs> like, let's be real. Like, I know what you mean. I know what you mean. Traditionally, you'd, I'd agree with you, Dylan. But the difference is, yeah. this is season yeah. nine AD carry, mate. And season nine AD carry isn't people just in lane, just playing fucking AD carries, just auto attack and wait for twenty five minutes, right? You know, like it is a little bit different this year. Um, I don't think so. Our last game we played against Splice, I think he was like nine and one and like three thousand gold ahead of anyone else on our team. To be and fair, you were playing against Splice, so like until the thirty minute yeah. warning starts coming, you know, you don't even have to worry about anything on that. I, I think he can take over games completely. Um, okay, he can, but I think it's kind of hard for the role, honestly. And what I can say is, at least in Spring Split, um, we did not play many aggressive lane spot lane. We played mostly Ezreal and Kai'Sa, almost exclusively, mm -hmm. which are scaling picks and did not play... To be fair, Lucian was, I think, banned in 18 out of our 18 games for a reason, for a very good reason. But there was probably other more aggressive options we could have taken. So, yeah, I think the criticism is kind of fair in that respect, but I don't think that's one of his weaknesses as a player, no. Mm -hmm. What do you think about the, in, it, since you alluded there, like the, the role itself is less impactful. I actually saw the other day, I think it was even Forgiven was complaining about this on Twitter, where if you were someone who's an old school lady carry player, the logic goes like this, right? You guys in the top lane in the middle, and you can have the first 25 minutes, right? Yeah, you guys get to do solo kills and fight each other and get ganks and stuff. My job is just chill, get all those far farm. Who cares if I get any kills? Just get all that farm, get my two or three items. Now it's my time. Now it's the team fight. It's all about me. Like I have to, I, like now I can I can know this target I can kill. If he uses his all, I, I, he's available. They claim now basically, cause it, it feels like every role got buffed in the game. I mean, you even see now with how, yeah. some of the players who play Pike, fucking support can be like taking over the game now and killing everyone. So if, if you're AD carry, it's not that your role got nerfed, but you are kind of like way less impactful, right? No, but AD carry was like by far the most broken role for like two seasons, like in the entire game was played around, rotating around your AD carry for the whole game and getting him four items. And then he was the decider in every single team fight. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't think AD carry is necessarily like super weak. It's still one of the stronger roles for carrying games and you routinely see players doing it. It's just, uh, as you said, it's just more balanced, I think, than it used to be. And people, what do you think local? I mean, 100%. You think it's balanced local, come on. Well, balanced is like, if everyone has like 20% onus on the outcome of the game, like maybe that is the balance, but we come to expect something different due to how strong AD carry has been in the past. Like when Forgiven's comparing like how, like it doesn't, it feels like we're nerfed or it feels like we aren't as strong. It's cause you aren't a fucking God mode champion anymore. So yes, in a sense it's balanced, but People have been bypassing like what makes AD carries weak by playing other stuff like playing Sona and then playing whatever Yasuo, playing whatever can be played bottom to not play AD carry because yes, like the role isn't as impactful as before. And this like end game of needing a four item AD carry to win team fights just isn't true anymore. So I just, I think that style of I'm going to be a hard, ca hard carry, like I'm going to wait until four, three items to actually impact the game is a lot less useful than it has been. You've just hit on some gold there, Loco. Because mm -hmm. here's the question, Dylan. One thing you never mentioned at any time when you were talking about upset there. I've never even heard you mention the word mage. Where the fuck are the mages at? This guy's this guy's season eight hand summer. He only plays the eighty carries. Well, he in season what eight he played quite a few mages in summer split. Yeah, where are they um, now though? Season nine, mate. The mages can be played, right? They're pretty good. If if we think that mages are the right 
option for our team. I think he will play them and he will play them well. Uh, I just think that he can carry games harder on AD carry at this point in time. Hmm. Okay. Like, are you someone in the general meta who thinks that mages are overvalued? Hmm? Yeah. Do you think in the like, general meta, like they're a bit exaggerated as how like good they are? Is Sona a mage? Like, what, what are you, what are we defining mage? Sure. Like, non AD okay. bot, let's say non, bot. Let's say non AD carry. Do you think non AD carries are overvalued? Oh, no. I think non AD carries are, are, are pretty good, yeah. Are, are pretty good but like i think like mages as far as like actual mages aren't like super good or anything i don't think they're super op like cassio and syndra and champs like this uh -huh. okay i guess one thing i did want to ask because you're primary like a european coach now is i watch recent or like the recent european games and some of the pick and ban priorities are vastly different from na i mean like the most obvious one is sona like europe barely plays sona and even when sona is played it loses europe doesn't put as much high prio on karma as na does like what do you think about those two champions sona and karma and like na prioritizing them as like first pick op but karma like at least from what i understand karma is first rotation or ban in most games still I don't think it's it's it gets through every now and then depending on the teams, but I think it's still a priority pick for most teams. There's I see. there's times in Europe where it doesn't get picked or it goes down to second rotation. Where in NA, it's almost always permaban or first rotation. So yes, it is somewhat of a priority, but in NA, it's like must not give like a must pick champion compared to Europe where it's a little bit lower. The champion also got nerfed, right? Like I think part of that has to do with the fact that people just ad adjusted kind of slowly. Like, it was for sure like blue side first pick or have to ban. Like I think it was two patches ago before mm -hmm. it got nerfed, kind of like halfway back towards where it was. Mm -hmm. So what, what about Sona then? Because obviously, like I mean, if you just watch TSM, this split they were spamming the fuck out of that every time they could. Also got nerfed a bit. Also, I think the European games play pretty aggressive and people are willing to put a lot of pressure into bot lane and snowball the games if you play too much Sona. And that's kind of why we've seen a lot less of it. But there are still some teams who play Sona for sure. Hmm. I've got a question for you along those lines. Obviously, it's a bit of an unfair one because it's years since you've, can't, you've been a coach in NA. Yeah. But one thing I really wonder about is whenever like playing styles develop within a region, I always find it very interesting because it's not as simple as saying like these guys are all idiots, so you know what they're doing. Like some of these people are Korean coaches, like they didn't live in NA their whole life. So when NA has developed this reputation, like they don't understand side laning, even if they pick like strong carries there, they don't really play through them very often. They still group mid, they still team fight, they still win and lose half the game at the fucking baron like you know kind of like the classic na meme europe obviously it isn't like i will say this every european team isn't one three one in like fucking geniuses all the time that's also an exaggeration but there's certainly a lot more of that and that has always been more the european style generally makes sense when you've got super strong mids etc but is there a reason you think why na just hasn't broken out of that mindset i think a lot of it I can't know this for sure, like this is kind of speculation, but I think a lot of it has to do with the Korean imports of both players and coaches from the LCK. Um, from talking to other coaches and players who have worked with Korean coaches or have played in Korea with Korean coaches, um, I hear them saying things like, apparently they say things like, any fight that has risk is not a good fight. The perfect game of League of Legends has zero kills, like stuff like this, like yeah. really ridiculous. And I know there has been a lot of Korean imports, a lot of Korean coaches into NA, and that must have something to do with at least um, that mentality. And I think it kind of like has bitten Korea quite quite a bit. I don't think that passivity is really a reason why NA is bad. I think it's other problems. Just a contributing but, factor. But at, but for sure for sure that I think is decent amount of at least the playstyle differences. Whereas Europe, just about, there's yes, very few yeah, Korean. And everyone's really cocky, really aggressive, both mm -hmm. in personality and play style. Sure. And the top teams that people emulate are teams that are trying to be really inventive and really push the limits of the game. Hmm. I'll just mention, by the way, just for people who didn't follow the implied concept there, is if the Korean coach really believes you shouldn't take risks, you play the safest, like by the numbers route, the idea would be if is if your team's leading, yeah, you go and do a Baron dance and you just win off that. Like why risk one guy getting caught in a side lane or fucking up the one three one so you don't do it quite correctly and then the middle three die? Like there's a million ways that can go wrong if you don't execute it very, very well. So if your if your whole mentality is I'll always avoid risk, it makes more sense to just team fight if you think you've got the better comp and you pick for it and you're leading in the game. I guess that does make logical sense. I personally don't agree with it. Like, I think it kind of goes again back to what you said before about individual players. Like, I, yeah, I put it this way. Probably that as well, yeah. If you look at the style at the moment, I mean, in spring, people always use the term like acceleration. Like you try to accelerate the game when you get the edge, when you someone's got kills on them, etc. Is the 
did, do you actually think that comes from European style of play? Like, did we invent that? Um, what do you mean, like playing really aggressive and really fast? Yeah, playing, playing like the kind of speed I, that they I think play now. China's been playing like that for a while. I do think something that the European teams were really good at, um, and I saw last year kind of in both MSI and World specifically, is the European teams put a really heavy emphasis on mid lane and mid lane control and using that as your kind of like pinpoint for the game. Um, when we first went to Worlds last year, um, we were scrimming the Korean teams and a lot of it was very gank focused, a lot of very like kill setup bot lane focused, a lot of like splitting the map, a, a lot of very different stuff. Whereas um, both G2 and Fnatic were playing a lot more primarily through mid lane because we feel like it's the center of the map. It's where you can actually like control everything from and I think by the end of the tournament and with a little help from our friends of a Akali, Aatrox, Irelia, etc. I uh, ended up being by far the dominant strategy and as I think retained to be the dominant strategy throughout this year. So yeah, I, I think that part Europe kind of helped to develop more so than uh, Korea was just kind of like AFK at Worlds and China was playing primarily through bot lane um, and NA was just not that good, but then C9 found some stuff that really worked f worked for them near the end of the tournament, so that was good too. Sure. By the way, um, if we want to talk about Fnatic, there's one more player that was in your era that I should ask about. So a player that's had massive ups and downs this year is Whipple, obviously, because there's yeah. no so as to swap in and out. So now he's the full-time starter, and as I implied in the spring, when they actually got it going, they they pretty much put him on a fucking island. They just said, like, see you, mate. You, you have a good time. We're playing through Reckless now. And they, yeah, Reckless right, yeah. carried a lot of the games. But as a result, it made Whipple look quite bad at times. And I noticed that fans have been really hot and cold. They either thought, like, at Worlds, he was the best top player ever from the West, or he's, like, he's the problem in the team. So where, who was Whipple to you, and, and how do you think they use him in Fnatic? Uh, spring split, though, he was also playing really bad. Like, I think he's a terrific player, really good sure. right now, one of the best top laners um, in the league. Uh, at Worlds was, in, like, really insane as well. But Spring Split, I think he, he wasn't playing the game that much, and he wasn't really, like, he didn't, ha like, wasn't putting his full 100%, at least from what I understand. He was playing kind of bad, and then on top of that, what you said, yeah, they were, like, perma bot lane. So it was, like, he wasn't playing that good, and they were perma bot lane, so he had a lot of int games for sure. Um, but I think he's he's a good player, and he seems to be playing much better in summer, mm -hmm. I would say. Well, let me ask you this question. He, he's also a player that will always push, will always fight, mm -hmm. will always trade. Yes, always let me. Push, no matter what. So that's something I want yeah. to ask about. Let, You're gonna yeah. get some games. Let me follow up on that. So in summer, I don't think Whippo really like. He did get better, but more so they're adapting to how Whippo is playing. Like Brox is realizing like this guy's gonna push, yeah. this guy's gonna be aggressive no matter what. So I'm gonna match him. I'm gonna make sure I'm there. I'm gonna make sure I can gank for him early. I'm gonna make sure I can counter gank. I can make sure I'm going through lane. More so than like Whippo adapting to the situation, wasn't it Brock such just accommodating and Whippo's just still the same player he is? I remember the 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 first days we were screwing with him in Spring Split, he would play he was playing just only gangplank at the time. It was like super broken and he had like gangplank one trick. Play your best champ in scrims because you're you're just a rookie, right? Mm -hmm. And every single game, he would just all in level one, no matter what. He would just all in the whole lane level one, no matter what, because he just he felt like it was the optimal strategy with the champion. <laughs> and then he would talk to Broxa, and they would talk about jungle path to make the plan for the game. And Broxa would be like, "Okay, uh, should I path towards spot or top?" And then people would be like, "Oh, it's it's really fine. You, like like you, I can adjust if you want to path bot this game. It's really really fine." And I'd have to take Broxa's all side. I would I would have to. Yeah, he still went all in, of course. And, <laughs> and, and I would have to bring Brox aside and be like, "Broxa, even if he tells you to path the bot when he's playing gangplank, you have to go top level three or he's gonna die." It was sure. just like a fact. Like he, he's gotten better at this stuff for sure. Like that was like when he was a complete rookie. But that's really like his mindset on it, or at least mm -hmm. was back then. Okay, because what I wanted to ask was, does that fit with your philosophy? Like you were telling us before, like your preferences for jungler and how you want them to play generally. What about top lane then? Because I mean, we've already talked about your team, but in when in terms of Whipple, this is someone where, I mean, in in some senses, he's trying to be like a caps of the top lane. He's trying to just push it as far as he can and get every advantage he can, every kill he can. What do you think about that as a style for top lane as a role, though? I think if you can press advantage really well and then you can bring the jungler top later in the game, I think that is really, really good for the game. Damn. If you can play like this. That's immortal Dylan that, talking. I think that permanently playing through top lane for the whole game of League of Legends, like some teams try, even to this day, is really bad. 
That's what I think. That's post immortal Dylan talking. What? Well, so yeah. Give us like a few reasons. Like, why is it bad? Do you think? Um, just generally, your dual lane is mid, and then mid is really important for like pressuring the map, for example. And yeah, and and AD carry is just AD carry and mid are just the roles to play around in the mid game. The way the map is set up, like your top laner goes bot and Baron is up. Like if you're running bot with your top laner, then you're not near the Baron, you're not near the mid lane, you're not near anything that's important. So I would say that. Also, okay. the AD carries kill the turrets faster. So if you're trading side, I guess it's a bit different with Herald these days. So you can trade a bit more, but at least that used to be like before turret plates and Herald being super OP. Like if one team, let's say last year, would go bot with four and one team would go top with two or three, like the turret would just die bot lane faster and you just win the trade. So sure. again, it's different now, but. And one other thing that people are doing is like just randomly swapping bot lane to top side. Like it's literally two versus one. Even if your top lane carry is winning and you get swapped on and you don't call the swap, then you're suddenly in a losing situation and you have to go back and match. Yeah. Anyway, right, like, local. Mm -hmm. I'll ask you this first. So as he alluded to, last few weeks have been pretty harsh on Fnatic. Obviously, they had the one game where they subbed Reckless out and lost, but then they had the game where they just straight up lost to basically Misfits Academy. Mm -hmm. Lost fucking. I mean, it was it was the re sub Reckless game when they lost to Rogue. The, it's been a, a bad run of form recently. Like, what do you think of where Fnatic's at at the moment? I'm so confused. I'm like, they draft stuff like Renekton, Aatrox, and pick tenth pick cart this jungle with it. Whenever you're picking Renekton or Aatrox, like you want to enable these solo laners as much as possible. Like I I forget the all the matchups, but it was Renekton and Aatrox and the enemy, I want to say one was Akali, other one was Akali Akali Relia, and their jungle is Zin Zhao. If the game is going to be so solo lane focused, why do you have a Karthus? And that's not even Brox's strength. So Fnatic found something that really works, like play around Whippo. Bot lane, play safe, let Hillisan roam, and then activate mid lane with the leaves we have from top and jungle support moving together. And then they suddenly move away from that for the Misfits match. So I'm just confused. It's not the Fnatic I saw leading up to it, and they went with something completely different, and it just felt flat on their face. So yeah, I'm just, I'm just confused. I think that Fnatic had a very, 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 like, I, I think they're a good team. I would be really surprised if they don't end the split like near the top. But I think they just had really insane strategies for the first like six, seven matches of the split. Their early jungle paths were really insane. Their level ones were really insane. Their drafts were really invented. They they brought up stuff like the TF Pike, which for example, our first game on stage, you think we had played against TF Pike combo before, before we go on stage against them? Like it was it was inventive, it was new, and it was really, really strong. So and and they knew how to draft them as well. Like it all worked together with the drafts, so like counter pick and all of this. But I think like you can ban these champions and or counterpick these champions and like when you see it coming and teams are often like seeing it coming and target banning them very well um it becomes a bit harder for them to win through the like the normal ways that they were winning throughout the first bit of the split yeah they can we play them this week so. do you think that approach to the game comes from young buck um what do you what do you mean like the do you, the the came one you think came, came up with the concept and, and designed the the intricacies and stuff the team has like five or six really loud voices. Um, I think like, I, I don't want to say it's not him and to make it sound like I'm flaming him. Like it's sure. just every, everybody's coming up with the ideas and like you have a player that really loves TF, for example, Nemesis loves TF and Hillisang really loves Pike. Like you just play their champions and they figure out a way to draft it. I think the drafts for sure, like would have to be at least partially young buck, of course. Mm. It, sure. Isn't it just like, so back, like, isn't it backward to put Broxa on Karthus? Like, as someone that coached Broxa, as someone like that coaches an LEC, what do you think about that pick, considering all the, the context? The, the logic was AD top lane, mm -hmm. AD, AD mid lane, um, both champs that can like all in with Karthus ult. Mm -hmm. um, sure. Basically, when G, G2 was playing a lot of Karthus in Spring Split, what they would do is they would play some stuff like Irelia in one lane, mm -hmm. and then Jarvan or something in the other lane, I think. Jarvan and Karthus was a combo Fnatic played against us in Spring Split. So you just hit level 6, you just all in with Karthus ult, and mm -hmm. the guy just dies. Mm -hmm. I think that's what they were thinking. Also, Renekton, I think, had a favorable matchup into both Irelia and Akali in that game. Mm -hmm. And Aatrox mid should be, like, okay, I think, mid against both. So I think they were just thinking two counterpick solo matchups, Karthus hits 6, the solo lanes fight, and they all in. I think that's what the thought was. Obviously, it like really, really didn't work. But that can be the game plan. Yeah. But the other team's game plan is: we have Zinzo. We can gank you level two. We can gank you level three. We can gank you level four. We can come find you at level six also, where Karthus 
is going to be farming for a decent portion of the game, and you're not going to be one to match the Jin Zhao in the 2v2. Like, does yeah, the counter picks I- matter if your jungler isn't going to be there and you're the one that's being scared about the gank? So I just didn't understand the game plan at all. Yeah, I don't think it was that good, but yeah. Whatever. Anyway, on Fnatic, though, like, even though Dylan says that they should finish high up, I sort of agree. Like, put it this way, if I had to bet, I'm I'm still not personally all in on Splice, so I don't really know if they'll be second. I think Fnatic's adding me second or third this split, but I don't think they can win this split, personally. I already was a little bit out on them even when they had the winning streak mm-hmm. because so much of it looked like whoever came up with this draft's a genius. What a great plan on level one. But it's like, are you going to have three of those in a full best of five series? I don't think so. So eventually you're going to have to play normal League of Legends and they're good, but there's a, there's a separation for me between them. And I, I actually think the difference is before Fnatic was getting close to G2. Now it's like there's G2 and then there's, and then the rest is yeah. just a bunch down here. And so to me, they've definitely got threats from the splices of the world. At, at the moment, Origin looks like shit, but if they get it together for the playoffs, obviously they could be good. In theory, there's the Schalke team. I was like, 7-5 record. You've got to at least mention them, right? Don't know about that. You'll yeah. see. You have to make the playoffs. We, we, we play the them on Friday, so, so it's, okay. uh, yeah. Hmm. Well, that's we it. Play, if you beat I them think, on Friday, I'll just yeah. declare they're dead then, right? Yeah. the end. Yeah, of course. <laughs> what, why do you think OG is struggling so much? Because they weren't... They yeah, were the what do you think about OG? They were the second best team in Springs. And to see Because here's the thing. Like, correct me if I'm wrong, Dylan. I would guess, because I notice... All analysts I talk to love Origin because they love yeah. like the players they think are really smart, like they're the right players for the roles, even the setups in the beginning, the summer looked so genius. Like like even I, I even said that all you need to know about Origin is when they played that first game against G2, even though they lost, I left I finished the game going like, did they even make any mistakes in this game? They looked like they played fucking amazing. They just lost because G2 was just unbelievable. Like at the moment, it's bad. It's a bad state of affairs the last yeah. few weeks. What do you think of Origin at the moment? Uh, we also play Origin this week. so uh, <laughs> Okay, here we go. Big words then. This is going to be feisty. Yeah. So I, they, there's, what, 0-4, I think, in their past four games. Yikes. Um, I, well, whereas I think Fnatic is slightly worse than, than like they showed for the first bit of the split. I think it's kind of the opposite for Origin. I think they're actually better than their stage results. Okay. Um, I think they've had some issues on stage with enemies just really really camping mid with support jungle and nukes had like two or three bad games which is weird for him i don't think it usually happens sure and it seems like they're having difficulties getting a lot of proactive proactivity from like their 2v2s or their jungle like i'm not sure if it's to blame on cold it could be on the team or whatever but they're just it doesn't feel like they're like forcing stuff and drafting strong 2v2s even though even though in some games they do draft strong 2v2s it doesn't it doesn't look like they're like forcing the game enough and then i think mechanically they have five good players but they don't have like really 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 in, insane players on like all five roles for example like a team like g2 does sure mm. no that's another thing that's one thing even when the origin was really good i always did tell people like the reason personally why i would never have picked them to win lec is like their, the problem with their lineup is if you go player by player and you go, right, I can get your Alfari, you go, cool, pretty good fucking top laner, always plays well by himself, get you cold, yeah, he's been a good jungler, you know, it's like no one's bad, but at the end of the team, it's like, wait, wait a minute, where's the superstar player? Where's the guy who's going to be the MVP who's going to take over the whole game? Who's going to Like, yeah. in theory, on paper... That looked like Nuke Duck. That was be Nuke Duck, yeah. but, Nuke, but personally, I think the last few years... I think that Nuke Duck's way in the past. That's an example of a Whoa. narrative actually helping someone local. Wait, I think you don't narrative. think in Nuke spring? Gonna... In spring? You don't think so? Listen, you... local. Mm-hmm. Nuke Duck was really of... smurfing in spring, but I'm... like, and yeah, last yeah, some, yeah, some when he was on Schalke in that roster. He has some games, but generally he's not a player I personally think is going to be the MVP of the league. So Patrick, I, I think, has still... The problem with Patrick is everyone just looks at the potential. Mm-hmm. Like he's, still, he's definitely a very good player, but again, is he going to be the best AD carry? Probably not. So... I think that's an issue. And then the other issue is, like, it does look a little bit like Cold changed up whatever the fuck he's doing in the jungle. I'm not smart enough about jungle to know what that might be, but it does look like he's changed his style somehow. So I agree with you, like, them having above average players across the board, but Nuke Duck is, like, that one shining star. Like, it's so bullshit to compare him to Caps because Caps is an anomaly on its own, but without, like, someone like Caps existing, he'd be the one, like, fighting for the best mid laner of Europe and potentially best mid laner of West. Wait a minute. What, what do you mean it's bullshit to compare them? To win LEC, he has no, no, to beat G2 and I, Caps. I agree. I, but, you know? like, in general, in, of this roster, it's just G2, G2 as a whole and Caps individually is, like, 
lightning in a bottle. It's not something oh, that's... Oh, pretty swear. I would say, yeah, they have the most unfair roster possible, basically. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't blame any coach who doesn't win against them. It's like, what fucking game plan are you supposed to come up with? You know, mm-hmm. It's not an anime, you know. There's no trap card you pull at the end. They're like, oh, now your whole team collapses. I'd love it if that was real. I think Nuke's record against Caps be something like zero and like f- one and 15 or something. Like It's really, really sure. disgusting head-to-head record. To I, be fair, like mm-hmm. I think Caps has had some pretty good teams around him, but... Obviously, yeah. Yeah. I I don't know what's wrong with OG and Summer and why they're doing so badly, but regarding like roster strength, like I think like under normal circumstances and there isn't these like lightning in a bottle teams like G2 existing, like this is definitely like a LEC championship level roster. Yeah, I think that's pretty, fairly reasonable. Well, they got they got spring. second. They got second yeah. to G2 in spring, so I, it's hard to argue. Yeah. I think the other problem they have as well is like not only in mid lane like you described there, but I think even just stylistically, G2 is like probably the worst style for them to have to play against. So there's another problem. If number one, who's the clear number one, is like almost a stylistic counter to you and you're all the clear number two. I mean, they're not clear number two now, but they were yeah. in the spring. That's a bad space to be in. I can tell you from any game. I mean, ask fucking some of the KT roster teams over the years. It sucks being number two when number one's the one that it can always beat you in the way that matters the most, you know? So like, anyway, put that to one side a second. Loco. Hmm? There's no way you think they're better than the record, right? G- I mean, with OG, I'm just confused. Um, the cold thing very confusing, and also like the Nuke Duck thing really confusing. In like their core, ro- in the losses where Nuke Duck just gets ganked by things that are obvious, like Jungle is coming from this side and he's hugging the wrong side. Support Mia should be called, and he's still playing up and he's still playing for the wave. Like mistakes like that aren't like. It's it's not like it was something so ingenious where the enemy team outsmarted Nuke Duck and he got outplayed, but it's more so it was unforced mistake. It seems like he's fumbling more so than someone's tripping him up. So I can't figure out that one. And I also can't figure out the cold kind of like sometimes getting outpassed or sometimes being on the wrong side of the jungle completely and missing one quadrant. Like stuff like that, it's just they're fumbling. They're not tripping because someone is like pushing them. It's just what are you guys doing? Like, you guys are fucking up your own shit. Like, you guys are fucking up on your own basics, your own fundamentals, something that OG was incredibly strong on last split. So that one is just confused. Oh, sorry, I, just, I thought you were going to say they, won't keep, they won't keep losing, uh, that's for sure. Okay. Mm-hmm. I think Here's the problem. We get to us, you know, but after that, I, th- I think they'll start winning. Okay. That's the thing. This is a pure speculation. It's based on nothing. I don't have any inside info here. But if I had to speculate personally, I think that they they remind me of the sorts of teams where, because except for Patrick, it's all veterans in that team. They've all been in many different teams. They've all been to finals and worlds and shit. When you have players like that and all the team are players like that, and in your mind, you can't ever be bad. Like, even if you're doing bad in the game now, it's just a problem we'll fix and they'll come back next week. Or this guy, you know, I know he's good. Nuke Duke's great. He'll play great next week. The problem with that mentality is that's a great mentality to drop in the rankings. And the problem is they might end up being right. They might do like an old school mm-hmm. expect as soas and just fucking turn up to the playoffs and go, right, it's the playoffs now. And now I'll actually play real fucking League of Legends. I was dicking around in all those games and maybe they'll be great. The problem with that is obviously that is a dangerous path to go down. Like just assuming that, you know, when you lose games, ah, those, those don't count or, you know, that's not really who I am as a player. That can definitely bite you, but I kind of personally buy into it a little bit. Like, I think when you have their players, I find it hard to believe you're going to go to the playoffs and just get rocked out by some, like, fourth-place team or something. I don't, just don't see it happening for OG. At this point, they still have they have to question, like, what's going on. Like, they have to question, oh, like, why are we fucking yeah. up? And if, they have to play individual like, fingers. three or four more games, playoffs is actually a threat for them. So if they lose a couple more, like, you never know. True. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. But I think they've already played Fnatic and G2 twice, by the way. Like, when you look at standings, you also need to look at, like, what matches they have left. Mm-hmm. They've got some easier yes, games, right. let's, let's say, like, near the end. You know, they played Fnatic and G2 twice. Sure, absolutely. Right, okay, one team, then, that's in the top of the rankings that we have not mentioned yet. And this is the team where, if you believe Fnatic's going down, this is supposed to be the team that's going to replace them, and it is Splice. So here's another team, Dylan, that's very, very contentious. Yeah. Because a lot of... Uh, this is the team where... When I said before, like OG is the team that all the analysts love, Splice is the team all the analysts hate <laughs> and think is like they don't know how to play the game, like they're good in team fights, like they get the most out of the players in some level, but a lot of people like mad criticisms for the mid game. They think the style is kind of a bit of anachronism for Europe in, at the current moment. Give us your thoughts on Splice, because they're obviously winning a fuck ton of games. I think that Splice are a top five team for sure. Top five. Um, I don't. They were yeah, four, four, four last split. That's even dropping them down. 
That's uh, fun. No, no I, I, I could see them end anywhere from like second to fifth. That's kind of what I mean. Okay. Like they, they could, they could do quite well. You know, like I don't think they're gonna win the split okay. or anything, mm -hmm. but I, I think they could end anywhere in there. I think their scores are like slightly like there's just a few wins that they have in the split that I feel like were kind of a bit. I don't want to say random, but like not like through them playing super good. So I think maybe they have like a win or two more than they would in like a totally normal standings. Mm. Um, I well, think they're good. The question. I think oh, they sorry, have five players as well. Like I think all their players are good. It's another team that like, I, I like to be a top four, top five team in Europe right now. You can't have like weak players. I think Xerxes is quite good. I think his early game has been really, really, really good this split. The Kiana. Um, yeah, yeah, the Kiana. Um, but I think they've kind of cheesed a win or two, and then had a couple wins like this Vitality game, which like. Man, like they really, I feel like they really should have lost that game. Mm -hmm. um, that was a bad game for man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I don't think they'll like probably get first or second, honestly, but I think they're solid. They're fine. Because mm -hmm. the I, problem I, I have is that. Oh, go on. Sorry. Like, so, usually I would say that, that G2 is far above any everyone. And then there's like Fnatic, OG are like the teams that did well last split. But with Fnatic and OG doing quite a bit worse, I think between Fnatic, OG, my team, Schalke, and um, Spice, it's kind of a toss-up in, in the last half of the split. I think all, like I could see a lot sure. of combinations of, of these four teams. So well, that's why the interesting part for me is like it, this season, because of what you just said, isn't about just securing playoffs. It's about what seed you get, actually. Because yeah. if, those, if those teams play different matchups, you're going to get completely different semi-finals etc like i'd love to see some of the matches some of them i think would be a nightmare for some of these teams mm -hmm. for sure so one like thing that was stated recently in a broadcast from shakarez is how good humanoid has been playing and with how bad nuke duck's been playing the comment that was made is humanoid is the second best mid laner in lec at the moment what's your take on that dylan i would say that in the stage matches for this split in all of the best of ones that's fair yeah He's played really good on stage. Mm -hmm. I think he's like good. I, I would say he's def definitely like top four mid for sure. Mm -hmm. Second, not sure. I still would like give credit to Nuke over that. Mm -hmm. And honestly, I think that um, I think Abba can actually has much higher highs uh, than Humanoid. Uh, yeah, like as a player, I've seen him play a lot. Mm -hmm. And yeah. How good do you I think? Could... How good do you think he would be if the meta completely shifted away from Quirky Azir? Because I think he's a player that's benefiting so heavily from the current mid pulls. No, he he had like that insane Kiana pop off game. Yeah, and Kiana's other a Akali a Kali pop off games too. I don't think I don't think he's like a Quirky Azir only player. I actually think it's the opposite local. I think yeah. his problem right now is mm -hmm. it was only in the second split, right? So logically, you'd expect someone, if they're going to be an amazing player, mm -hmm. to be slightly better in the second split than the first split, right? If they're mm -hmm. going to be a truly great player and not just drop off because they had to get the experience under their belt, they had to play with their teammates and learn them. Well, the problem is, like, yes, you're right. He definitely mains the fuck out of those champions. But if you add those champions and then you're on a team that goes to these fucking 35-minute, 40 games all the time you're not really going to have that many chances to actually fucking pop off. Like, no one's going all in and just getting seven solo kills on fucking Azir, mate. That isn't happening. So there's actually, like, right now, I think he's actually got not that great a setup. Personally, what I would love to see is, it, I'd love to see this guy on fucking Fnatic and give this guy any chance he wants and play through this guy in the middle. I think he'd fucking tear the league up. Like, I don't think he'd be the best player, but I think he'd be a very good mid laner, personally. I think if Fnatic could go back in time and they could pick the mids again, I mean, I think any of the teams that picked up sure. the new mid laners, like, Easily, Humanoid has been the best rookie mid. Well, there's also the other side to that, which is if you go back in time now, I actually also think everyone who looked at that Mad Lions team is like, if you're going to take Nemesis, you may as well take self made as well. Like the two of them had such fucking fantastic synergy. Why not try it in LEC? So I think that was the mistake was also splitting them up because it's one of those scenarios where if Nemesis is getting all the kills, you think he's the player who's carrying, but mm -hmm. is he? He didn't look as good when he initially came in the LEC to me. So I don't know on that one. Mm. Anyway, moving on. What about, oh, actually I have a question about this. I, the, one, oh, the point I want to make about Splice is this. The, even though I would agree with most of what you said, like I think most of the players on the team are pretty good. Like I actually think Cersei is probably a bit underrated because he does look like he just farms, but I think yeah, there's like a logic as to why he does that. I think it actually makes this, sense. He's not farming anymore this split for sure. sure. Like that in past splits, that was an okay sure. story for him, but I don't think this split is. Well, he's not doing fuck all in the mid game, put that way. So that, I'm, I'm not a big fan <laughs> of that, but whatever. Yeah. I, th I actually think it, I, I, well, I mean, I literally had him on my show and he mm -hmm. basically implied that that's the way like they want him to play and that he thinks is the correct way. So. 
whatever. If, if someone's mentality is against what you want them to do, you can't say like, oh, we would be better if he did that. So he isn't, he just, he just want to do that. So, I recently he's been proactive, say. like the Kiana jungle game he had. I, I'm not sure if it was for the former games, but when did you have the episode? Because he might have changed in the recent game. I think the episode was about maybe four weeks ago, four or five weeks ago, I would guess. Okay. Maybe after the episode, he changed his mind. He has been Could aggressively. Be. Yeah. And then the other thing I would say about their team is, because here's the problem their team has is, right? So their team's at the moment tied for second place in the league. They've got all these wins over big team. Mm. People are actually giving them props. Like you're saying, people are saying Humanoid's one of the best mid laners. Kobe was literally getting called the best ADC in Europe. That was bullshit. I, that I was still bullshit. to this day don't understand what fucking like, I, I don't know what was in like the fucking coffee that day when they came up with that one, but whatever. It's, I guess it's a hype that, No, narrative. but the thing is, that wasn't a one person thing. That wasn't a one person thing. Yeah, he they got, all said it. No, he got voted all pro first. Yeah. He he got voted all pro first over. Right, what do you think of... about that then? In, in spring, when they gave Kobe all pro first ADC, what do you think of that? Um, I mean, some would say he's not even as good as you already carry, mate. I, yeah, the most well, obvious think, ones are perks I think and upset. Upsets. I think yeah. upset is better, but we also didn't make playoffs, so it's kind of hard to, to, sure. to get one of his best ADC in the league when your team doesn't make playoffs. I mean, I would say Reckless was better than personally. I think I think Reckless played was probably the best ADC in spring. Um, maybe actually, Perks had some in games in spring. Not really anymore. He, now he's probably like contender for MVP. No Perks, but mm -hmm. he, he had a, he had a few in games for sure. Um, so yeah, I, I think Reckless probably deserves it. I think that. All pro. I think we were joking that like the second all pro team kind of looked stronger than the first exactly. one. Exactly. <laughs> That's when you know narratives have taken over, man. Yeah. It's like you know, it's like if I would take the second all pro instead of the other one, you can draft the first one. I think you've got something's gone wrong there. Yeah. If the GMs like, would the, take the, the, the entire team, I think the entire team. If you oh. play them against each other, the second team would win. Speaking of like narratives and speaking of analysts, like recently in NA, it's been like a really big thing. Sneaky spoke up about it. Froggen spoke up about it. Like how much the desks and analysts, like me and Doran and other people included, how inaccurate we are and how we portray a incorrect image of the player. As someone that yeah. works within like the scene, someone that's working with a team, do you, how wrong are analysts in general? Like LEC, LCS, independent I mean, he did ones. say early, he doesn't even listen to him and he just fucking mute. So like, so, I'm, I'm, not a fan. Mm -hmm. I'm kind of like mute the cast, the Twitter, um, focus for, fo the for focus or cause it's um, shit. No, not because it's shit, just mm -hmm. for focus. Like okay. when we get to the studio, I make sure that the TV is muted and we're just focused on the game, like this sort of stuff. Like, I think. I think the European crew does a really, really good job. Um, on a, honestly, like the times I do watch, like the broadcast more for entertainment, I think it's like super, super good. I don't can't comment on any at all. That's where most of the flame has been, I think. But mm -hmm. I, I just don't watch. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I think they do a really good job. Yeah, the storylines can get out of control sometimes, for sure, absolutely. But I think it comes down to the fact that we see teams playing against each other like ten times. I think like yeah, at least ten times as much mm -hmm. as you see on stage we so only see best of ones mm -hmm. yeah you see best of ones so i can see my player like completely dumpster a player for 20 games in a row in scrims and then they go on stage and they die to a level two gank because the award was at the wrong time and then they die and then they lose their lane and all of a sudden this next guy is like the second best mid laner or the third best top laner and then this is how they start talking sure. about on the cast right, like sure. of course it's it's ridiculous when you just saw this guy stomp this kid 20 games in a row but ultimately it's just it, yeah, it's just performance versus actual skill and if it doesn't perform on stage then they can make their stories i think it's fine it's good for good for us ultimately isn't that what the player should be judged on like his performance on stage like that is who yeah. the player is not who he is in screen, yes. and who he is on stage yeah. no but i think what he said basically they're local like mm -hmm. i think he's even agreeing with you but because he even sort of said that we only see the he sees the scrims we don't mm -hmm. the problem is this is if you have a sample size of one game and you draw a really extreme yeah. conclusion, that could be totally skewed, couldn't it? Whereas his point is, if I've right. seen 21 games, I've probably got a better sense of who that player is. To some degree, your point's true as well. You have to perform on stage, obviously. There is, there is a game, right, where Vitality, like, I, again, I, I think really think the European broadcast does a good job, but for example, there's a game, I think it was Fnatic versus Vitality, and Vitality's first part of the split was just so, like, so, so yes. bad. Um, they have definitely picked it up. They're playing better now, but man, it, it was really ugly. And they just do this entire thing of like, who is the second best mid laner in Europe, Jizuke or Nemesis? This game will decide it. This game will decide who is the second best, second okay. best. This game will decide. And they go on it for like the entire cast. And at the end they're like, 
And that means that he is the second best mid laner. <laughs> right, that's it. Wait, wait. It's like, come the fuck on. I, okay, I'm going to defend the caster yeah. this on a little bit. So yeah. they have storyboard meetings. They're like, okay, what's the <laughs> narrative and what's the story for this week? And they want to push that story and they want to talk about that narrative. Dude, they don't want to be like, okay, this is a game, even though if Vitality wins or Fnatic wins, it doesn't determine the second best mid lane. Yeah. Like, that doesn't sell to the fans. Like, ultimately, their job is to tell a story and get the fans interested. And long as it is long as most of that is based on the truth, I think it's fine. I think it is fine to yeah, and make a story, make a narrative out of things. Like that is literally what their job is. It is storyteller for the player, storyteller for the league. I would rather have inaccurate stories that lots of people enjoy and love and that are great and gets people involved with the stories, even if like they're not completely aligned with reality, mm -hmm. than have it just be like boring. So I think ultimately it's good. It's just and get a bit ridiculous i would say this like even though you were just giving an example there of like you created two choices i don't think it has to be one or the other like listen there's a, I'll, I'll never brag about game knowledge in league of legends cs goes my game everyone mm -hmm. knows that you know i just follow the game like a fan and i watch it like a fan i think based and i try to apply concepts i know from team games and from watching the game a lot mm -hmm. so a lot of the shit i'm coming up with is obviously narratives but i would say this like i would say my biggest strength is that i think i'm i would hope i might broadcasts are entertaining etc i never lie ever never ever have given analysis i didn't actually believe mm. now that might mean that someone here's the thing if nuke duck wants to or frogger or someone wants to say i'm an idiot and i don't understand the game they're welcome to that opinion but i always give my actual op opinion so to me i don't think it's that you have to like like i like what i don't like about that look was what mm. you just said there that they storyboarded that concept like mm. i hate that aspect like to me it should just be genuinely coming from you as an analyst and i would hope vidius has a totally different perspective to maybe for scoring has her own perspective if someone has a, if someone has a shared one that's fine too because i give this example i gave it on mm. my other podcast that just came out today so none of no one's had a chance to see it but i made the point that um i hate the type of thinking and i know for a fact this exists in riot broadcasts mm -hmm. where they sit down and they go right for this game who's going to be on the side of origin when they play g2 and it's like that's a stupid concept if all three people who are the analysts think g 2s way better the analysis should be g 2s way better and this is the problem that's where you might think it's going to be boring right what if mm -hmm. everyone says g 2s better no because if all three people say g 2s better it sounds like g 2s a lot better and if they're a lot better that's what the story is look how incredible they are they can even take a team like origin with these players mm -hmm. and these guys have been in finals and they're going to dominate them and look at the shit they're going to be able to do to call and mm -hmm. toy him around the map and patrick's never even going to get in the game like he that, that's a fucking sick narrative and i never had to make any bullshit up i never had to have anyone play devil's advocate or pretend they're going to predict the team they don't believe is going to win in my opinion you fill in on the less entertaining games with the entertainment itself like you make the entertainment you make mm -hmm. a fun joke you mean you you maybe i won't say you lie but you exaggerate a little bit perhaps you put a bit of, i would say you put a bit of mustard on the hot dog mm -hmm. you don't change the whole meal it's still a hot dog you just put a bit of mustard on it get a bit, a bit spicier and then for the games that are amazing mm -hmm. mate i've natural. always said this the narrative comes from the game. Mm -hmm. I don't decide the narrative and then go, right, who am I going to put this on? Which AD carry am I going to say is passive? And not like, it's like, I, if I watch the game and it seems like he's passive, then that's the narrative. Mm. It's different ways to go about broadcasts. Like, as you said, like it's putting mustard on the hot dog to talk about how great G2 is. Maybe Origin doesn't have that great of a shot versus G2, but talking as if, like talking about the ways they can win and giving it a little bit fluff. You should do that anyway yeah. though, Walker. That's something people don't understand. People have got, here's the problem, right? I'll give you a very quick rant. It'll be like two mm -hmm. seconds. That's obviously a metaphor. <laughs> We're in the past, right, in CSGO, mm -hmm. We used to actually, in the early days, some of the desk courses used to actually say, fuck doing predictions. Like all that happens is fans just flame you if you're wrong. We can't know anywhere. Like for example, I've always said, it's bad enough in CSGO where I don't even know the maps they're gonna play. How the fuck are you supposed to predict a game before you've seen the draft in League of Legends? What is that shit? That's ridiculous. No one can know who's gonna win the game. Like they do their predictions at the beginning of the week on a graphic, like mm -hmm. you can't know almost, it. that's a pure guess in half those cases. You're just thinking what would the average fanatic look like versus the average origin, right? You, you're mm -hmm. figuring it out like that. So what I would say is this, I told people like Richard, who are my desk hosts, keep mm -hmm. it in, like keep predictions in. Cause, there, cause as you say, fans like them. Like yeah. fans want to make you, hear you make a judgment. Like I'm going to pick this team mm -hmm. or I'm going to give this reason, but do that at the end. Before that analysis should already be like, yes, this team's favored, but here's their best win conditions. This team's an underdog, but here's like the lane they could win through, the type of comp they could win from, the style that might give them an advantage. You always explain that even if they're a massive underdog, in my opinion. And then at the end, if you want to predict everyone predicts g2 you do but like that's my point 
people are using like too simplistic thinking, thinking it has to be one or the other, or it has to be one extreme. No, you can definitely, ve- there's a spectrum that you vary between depending on the game, in my opinion. And so I'd just say this to play it to anyone out there. I'll probably make a video on this topic. If you are an analyst, never let a player berate you. Never let a player tell you you're totally wrong and that his opinion's better than yours. Because guess what? I've already said this a million times. I can go and get players who are much better than that player and get them to disagree with him. What, is he now an idiot? No, that doesn't make sense. Everyone has a perspective. And hence why I say personally, if you're a player and you want to be involved, throw your hat in the ring, give your thoughts. Explain why you think that's different or why you think, you, you know, one of your... Like, here's a, great, here's a great way you could do it. This is a real tip for pro players. If you don't want to get shit on yourself, because obviously if you come out and say, like, local's wrong, I, I am great at mid lane or whatever, right? In that scenario, you're going to get flamed if you lose. Here's the clever way pros could defend defend each other. Don't defend yourself. So if Nuke Duck came out and said, I actually disagree with your uh, narrative about Caps. I actually think it's a very different play. That'd be an amazing comment. People would just take it as analysis. Yeah, someone might say maybe he's friends with Caps or something, but you see what I mean? It would actually have great impact, even though there wouldn't be very much danger, in my opinion, to that. Yeah. I'm not sure if players care enough. And I mean, sometimes we see players do it, like the infamous um, when Rush got shot on and then Acadian came out and defended Rush. And it wasn't looked at that I mean, positive. if they don't care enough, then they can yeah. shut the fuck up crying, can't they, little bitches? I, they, 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 don't don't care, no, they don't care enough That's, to stand up for each other. stand up for all the other analysts. I think the LEC broadcast does a fucking great job. I do think they, mm. they sometimes push it a little bit, and I don't like that riot angle. But it, within the context that you have to live in a riot broadcast world, mm-hmm. I think it's about the best you're going to get. I don't think you're ever going to get more, I, I, more I strong opinions than we got now at the moment. So I like everyone on that desk pretty much. Mm. But anyway... I pretty much have to go in like 10 minutes. So we'll, mm. let's do one more team. I obviously, so here's what we'll do. G2 or Misfits. Is there that much to talk about G2, Dylan? Do you have some like revolution? No, I, 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 G2 are insane. There's two I feel good. like they're being over talked about. Really. Whatever. Exactly. Mm. So here's yeah. the question, right? I, I, you can pick actually. Of all the teams remaining in the league, pick one you think would be interesting for you to talk about. Misfits, mm. XL. Mis- Misfits is most entertaining, no? Because of what happened. Mm. Okay. Oh, yeah, let's do that then. Yeah. What do you think? Or go ahead first. Like, like what? Like, for example, now that they're gone, it's safe now. Everyone doesn't have to be scared. We can criticize the old Misfits roster. <laughs> what, what do you think was the problem? Because obviously they had some big time players. I, I obviously there's no accountability on this, but I did predict they would not make playoffs when the roster was announced. Um, okay. Remember? <laughs> yeah, I was a hater. Um, I just think that the player the there is too many famous names. Um, mm. That not not enough actual like. Players were not bad, like they're not good, but they were more famous than they were like really, really good at the game. They were bigger oh, names almost, than they were better players. Yeah, yeah, bigger names than players almost across the board. It feels like they really drafted their players based on their reputations instead of doing a lot of actual work, looking at scrims throughout the year or looking at the games or scouting or asking players or really trying to figure out like who's super, super good and who's up and coming. Because like often big name players like are not actually like the most insane, you know? And it's some of these younger kids these days, especially the way the game is played now, really aggressively and really high mechanically, that are more important to get. So I think that's the main mistake they made for sure. Mm-hmm. And I think it's almost across the board. Like I don't even need to flame anyone in particular. It's just the entire roster seemed to be built with that philosophy. Mm-hmm. And yeah, didn't work. Um, also, they're really emotional players too. I know for sure, um, most of them. like. I don't think that's really a secret. So when things start going bad, it's it's probably hard for them to keep it together. Sure. So that's, I would even and, say and, like that. The real reason as well why I think they deserve more criticism than normal teams is because the, like I can tell you, local this team cost millions and millions oh, of euros in salary. Wait, like, okay. Outrageous numbers. So speaking of cost, what if a veteran said Max Floor was the highest paid player in EU, right? I believe he meant like the total contract. Like I would assume he has like a three-year contract with Misfits. It was for the highest overall, like, you know, mm-hmm. like the total amount. I don't think that necessarily means the salary year on year. Uh-huh. I'm not sure though. But that was my guess though. Yes, he said the Maxwell was the highest paid player. Even if it's contract amount, he is not. Per year, he is not. I know just through knowing some of the contracts, I know for a fact two contracts, it's like that. It's just, did Misfits overspend? Fuck yeah, but Maxwell is nowhere near the highest player. He's nowhere near the highest paid player. What does nowhere near mean? If you like to be specific, Mr. Make examples. So nowhere near would mean what? Like fucking 20th? 
I know two. Tenth? I know two from the ones I specifically know. Right, well, he's third at the moment, and mm. that's pretty fucking close. So yeah, I know going. I know two from we'll the... End the we'll end the episode on a bad note, too. Keep going. Uh, I know two from the ones I personally know, yeah. and then from speaking to two other GMs, they said they know more also. So I'm not sure exactly how far, but to say he is the highest valued contract is just straight bullshit. Well, you can call other Anas a liar at the end of the show if you want. Not really sure. Right, it's just beneficial. It's just factual. Sure factual. Enough. Right, it's, just factual. it's not factual. It is, I it is literally it is factual. factual. It is right. literally factual for him Local. to... Mm -hmm. Local, I'm just going to say this very quickly. Take mm -hmm. this point in. Think about it because it'll help mm -hmm. you in the future. Sure. Do you understand what a fact is? What you're talking about is called hearsay. A mm. fact would be you've seen the contract, you saw the number, and it's higher than Maxwell's. That's a fact. Mm -hmm. Yours is an opinion of someone you know that you trust. Now listen. No, as the, two, as the two are the I know. Two are the I know. <laughs> and you, I know you've two seen the contract as well, Thorin? I didn't so claim to know it was the highest. No, he so emailed it to you yesterday. Never, uh, never okay. claimed to know it was the highest. No, mate. Go back then, and watch the body. Then tomorrow. veteran, then it's Go back here. Watch the body. Then it's here. Say for veteran to say he is the highest. He's the talking most... about the other guy on no. the other shoulder. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Duncan. Veteran, for him yeah. to say, for him to say it is the highest valued contract, it would be hearsay and not fact unless he knew about every single contract. No. First of all, you don't know about every single contract. I am. So no, I'm not saying a, I know. I'm, I'm just, not saying no, I know. No, I'm just saying that's a bad argument. Look, all I'm saying is this, no. Loco. If you've seen contracts that actually say mm -hmm. a higher number, then you have a fact. Mm -hmm. But you did just say it, and two GMs told me. Mm -hmm. that, that, ignore that part of me. That's mm -hmm. like, if you've actually seen the contract, that makes your argument weaker. Just stick with that. I know wait, no. Two, wait, I wait you're, that saying, you're saying it's hearsay because I haven't seen every contract. I'm telling you it's hearsay. No, I'm saying I'm saying don't reference contracts you haven't seen. Okay. And then I'm, not, I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that. Right. Okay. Just don't say it's a for, fact. For veteran to say, Max that could Lohr, be true. Yeah, great. for veteran to say Max Lohr has the highest contract, it would be hearsay unless he thought every other contract, okay. right? It was, isn't I that agree. factual? Yeah. So it is that, hearsay. A, that, is that is definitely not a fact. It is a hearsay for him to say that and just straight bullshit. You can have that opinion if you want. Fair right, it's it's not opinion. It's just fact. Right, I just literally explained to you how some of the things that you claimed as a fact weren't a fact, but we'll ignore that for a second. Yes, Luckily sir. for me, Loco, I can oh. always do this, right, that you mm -hmm. can't do because you don't have my memory. I can always say this, viewers, get the VOD, go yeah. back 10 minutes, listen to what Loco said, and you decide whether that was a fact or not. Please maybe look decide. up what the fact is on, mm -hmm. on fucking dictionary.com and, go ahead and please maybe decide. send it to Loco. So anyway, that's, mm -hmm. that's to one side. But before the show ends, what do you think about the... Uh, oh, the one point I want to make, sorry, before Loco mm. sidetracked me there, because he definitely doesn't interrupt me, remember, because that'd be very rude. Of course. Uh, what, what I was going to say was, the reason why I think you should actually be harsher when you judge misfits is, like I say, they spent an incredible amount, and they're a team where they would have mm. had first refusal on a lot of players that are very good now. And I'm not talking about players where it's like a pure gamble. Like, I think a lot of people thought that people like, I mean, obvious example would be like self-made, humanoid, these players didn't go to the other top teams. Like these are players that could have been on this Misfits team if they really wanted them. There's plenty of names that could have gone instead of players that, like I would agree, Febovan's name is bigger than Febovan mm -hmm. the player. He's a good player, but he's not, like I wouldn't put him as a guy who's ever going to be the MVP in the league. Doesn't look like it, you know. Max Law, I personally think is completely washed. That's a tougher one because I think he was, he was kind of good in past years. So I have a tough time saying I would have made that choice myself. The Gorilla one, I have a problem anytime you take a duo that's done a lot together and split them up. You saw that it was Venom Who the fuck mm -hmm. knows which guy was doing what and how they'll be on their own. I think the problem with that is, is if you notice, I'm already pointing out there's a lot of question marks here. That I have the question mark, but if you're misfits, you have to know the answers to a lot of these before you make those moves, in my opinion. You know? Anyway, yeah, what do you think about the new really, squad? Um, they're crazy. I like it. It's fun, really mm -hmm. fun to watch. Um, I think their mid jungle has a lot of talent. Kira is always perma like perma rank one in US solo queue for the past years, like or at least top top three. Mm -hmm. um, so he obviously is a very aggressive and talented player. Um, a bit of a coin flipper, so uh, not the hugest fan of that. Sure. Um, obviously leader, same thing. So it kind of is like the identity of the team. I haven't sure. seen too much of them play. It's not like we've scrimmed them really since they swapped their full roster. Um, but they beat Fnatic, so that must that's a pretty decent accomplishment. So mm -hmm. sure. it can't be that bad. Um, when we played Misfits with Leader, like I was still, I had no idea what was going to happen. It was first game on stage, I think, and we played against them. Yes. And we just made a, a draft that would have a lot of uh, ability for him to make mistakes. Let's when he locked in way. the Yasuo, like mm -hmm. you looked like you had a pretty good comment in that minute. Like you looked like no, like, we we just picked Tom Kench Garner one two, knowing he will pick Yasuo one hundred out of a hundred times because it's leader. You and know? they're like, thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, it, it ended up working out, but there is for sure another way that game could have gone. 
So, sure. oh yeah. no, that's the thing as well, Dylan. I'm so glad this Misfits Academy team as in a whole got in because I actually thought it was kind of bullshit to take leader, throw him into a team that's already failing and doesn't work in the middle of the split and then just go like, right, go on then, carry the game. And then when he plays champions, which obviously themselves can coin flip like a motherfucker, the first two games he had on his, his famous champs, Akali and, and Yasuo, didn't look that great. Now, to be fair, it wasn't always fault, but it didn't look great, definitely. Scoreline looked shit. I'm so glad that, first of all, he got to play with his real team, and now he got to see at least what the other side of the coin looks like. The other side of the coin yeah. is pretty fucking cool, too. Well, yeah, what's it's, your, it's fun to watch. What's your judgment on leader after seeing him with, like, a little bit on the main roster and now a little bit with his entire roster? Like, is he, like, as hyped up as, like, people? Is he, how legit is he, in your opinion? I honestly have no idea. Like, like I think he for sure is not <coughs> bad. There's no way this guy is bad. Like he's very, very good at his champions mechanically. Mm -hmm. I it's it's just so hard because like there's been many players who have come to the league in EU that have like been really strong mechanically and good in fights, but they never actually figure out the team game. They never figure out how to actually work with their junglers, mm -hmm. how to manage the wave, how to like work on side lane, when to group after you push the side lane, when to keep mm -hmm. pushing, like all these things. And I just don't know like if he knows these things. Maybe he already does, maybe he doesn't. Um It'll be interesting to see for sure. For sure, he's not bad. And he here's has what a lot I'll say. Of oh, sorry. It, local, here's what I'll say about Leader. Like, I, I, I haven't seen enough games yet. Like, I didn't watch much of the Masters level. I just watched the EU Masters playoffs. That's it. So I only saw like three series or something. What I'll say about Leader is this. What I really like mm -hmm. about Leader is actually, this will sound mad, but the fact that he would pick Yasuo in that game there, where, like Dylan says, mm -hmm. basically, like, we were literally saying, like, come on, motherfucker, pick Yasuo. Mm -hmm. And he did. Because the thing about him, I had him on my show as well, is he is a person who actually does have the mentality that's like Caps. He, his mentality yeah. is like, I'm going to play the champion I want, mm -hmm. I'm going to play it to its absolute limits, mm -hmm. and I'm either going to win this whole game mm -hmm. or I'm going to throw the entire motherfucker. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're a coach, you don't maybe want to hear that from your mid laner, but <laughs> tell you what, that's the sort of person, Loco, if they actually do get very good, that's the person you want to go to war with. Whereas, you know what, some of the other mids who came in this year, some of those guys in the spring, they looked a bit tentative when they first got to mm -hmm. the league. They looked like they didn't speak up necessarily and say, I want this champion. They looked like they thought, you know, just it's like being the kid in the school who doesn't want to get asked the fucking question by the teacher. You just stay quiet at the back. You don't talk much and you just you try to hope you get away with it. Like a lot of them are like that. The problem is, in my opinion, this will sound like a weird statement. We haven't got time to go into it, but mm -hmm. I think it's harder to to draw out of a person that killer instinct yeah. than it yeah. is to sort of tell the person like listen just corral it a little bit and you'll be amazing mate like i'd rather go the second group personally and now to be fair the second set of people is a lot like, I, it, there's a lot of shorter supply of them you know it's ironic because <laughs> dylan has abadage that's the other situation no like but, having no, a timid but, player but, where but, you have to draw it out of but like uh I, I talked about it i think it was just mm -hmm. the mistake on my end and on the team's end and how we we handled drafting and our approach to it in the first split like i don't think okay Abe is definitely the type of player who can. He was a really, really, really active player, and I think he's shown that in in summer so far. Like he's played really, really active. Mm -hmm. So I think, like personality-wise, yeah, he's a bit more passive. But I, I think, just mistake from a team perspective in spring for sure. Mm -hmm. So yeah, okay. that criticism is completely valid for spring. Of course, it was it was it was a fuck up for sure. Mm -hmm. Right. I have to go now. So this is going to be the end of the episode. I think mm. we covered a lot of most of the good teams. We had an interesting <laughs> chat. Do you have mm. any final words you want to say? Is anyone you want to thank or anything? Um, nothing in particular, I guess the usual. Thanks to the fans. Uh, big week this week in LEC. We play Fnatic and Origin, and if we win, it will look really good. So I hope we can do so. Um, well, thank you so much for being on, Dylan. Yeah. All right. Cool. Um, All right. let so me go to. Wait, no. All right. Thank you so much to our all our Patreon supporter, but especially thank you to our gold Patreon supporters, Butt Pounder four twenty, Tobias Bernasconi, and Icelandic C nine fan. Without you guys, this wouldn't be possible. And thank you guys all so much for making it happen. 